Good morning, and I uh, want to call this hearing to order. Today we'll focus on federal transmission issues, including permitting, planning, and pricing of electricity <clears throat> transmission infrastructure. <clears throat> Additional investments in transmission infrastructure certainly will help our country meet anticipated future energy needs, but there are hurdles, particularly for wires that cross state lines and require agreement of multiple stakeholders. Two recent uh, transmission-related developments will help us evaluate the challenges facing the buildup of transmission infrastructure in this country. First, uh, the, the Department of Energy recently considered whether to designate to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission certain authorities granted to DOE by Congress in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. The proposal would have delegated to FERC DOE's authority to designate certain areas as national interest corridors. FERC already has backstop siting authority to site transmission facilities within uh, those corridors, so the delegation would have placed all of the national interest corridor authority under FERC's jurisdiction. As Secretary Chu's decision this week to not delegate this authority to FERC uh, is quite timely because uh, I noticed in my comments here he had not made that decision yet when they wrote this. So I've got to change my views a little bit here. <laughs> the other transmission issue before us today is FERC's recently finalized Order 1000, which outlines uh, changes to regional transmission planning and cost allocation. Although many of the implications of Order 1000 cannot be fully known or appreciated until compliance filings are made with FERC next year, it is important to evaluate the potential impact the, this final rule may have on, on stakeholders. Uh, Order 1000 seeks to provide flexibility to regions with respects to how regions should plan and pay for new transmission. Uh, there are a number of issues. For example, my home state of Kentucky, we do not have a renewable portfolio standard, and I have some counties in uh, my district that are in a regional transmission organization and others are not. So those counties could conceivably get stuck paying the bill for renewable energy transmission from states that do have a renewable portfolio standard without any uh, direct benefit. So we have a great panel of witnesses this morning. Uh, some people, uh, and we have a lot of diverse views, as a matter of fact, on, on this issue. But uh, I certainly want to thank our first panel for being here today, uh, Honorable John Wellinghoff, who's Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and Mrs. Lauren Azar, Senior Advisor, Office of the Secretary, U.S. Department of Energy. So we're going to look, we look forward to your testimony as well as testimony of all of our witnesses as we set out to explore uh, this important issue and how it is going to work as we move forward and what the impact is going to be uh, in a lot of different stakeholder interests. And so with that, uh, Mr. Rush, I recognize you for your opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to also thank uh, Chairman Wellenhoff and uh, Ms. Azar, uh, as well as the other expert witnesses on the second panel for appearing before uh, the subcommittee today. Mr. Chairman, today we are holding a hearing focusing on federal transition issues as they relate to siting, planning, and cost allocation for electricity transmission infrastructure. The basis of this hearing is FERC Order Number 1000, which was finalized in June 2011, and which addresses three main issues, planning, cost allocation, and the federal right of first refusal for incumbent transmission providers. Order 1000 establishes three new requirements requiring cost allocation. First, it requires that each Regional transmission planning process establish a regional cost allocation method for transmission lines selected in regional transmission uh, planning for the purposes of cost allocation. 
This cost allocation method must satisfy six principles. Those who do not benefit from a transmission project do not have to pay for it. That's the first principle. The second principle is the cost allocation must be at least, and I quote, roughly commensurate, end of quote, with estimated benefits. The third uh, method, uh, cost allocation method, is the benefit to cost thresholds must not exclude projects with significant net benefits. Fourthly, allocations of costs outside a region are not permitted unless the other regions agree. Uh, the fifth measure is the cost allocation methods and identification of beneficiaries must be transparent. And lastly, number six, different allocation methods can apply to different types of transmission uh, facilities. The second requirement is that neighboring regions must select a common interregional cost allocation method for new interregional transmission lines based on the same six principles that I have previously outlined. The third and final requirement allows for participant funding of new transmission lines where costs of a new transmission line are allocated only to entities that volunteer to uh, bear those costs, but under Order uh, 1000, this cannot be the regional or interregional cost allocation method. Mr. Chairman, many of the issues covered under Order 1000 are very technical uh, in nature, to say the least. But I applaud you for holding this hearing and understanding all these technicalities. I think we all uh, yeah, we we understand them, all right. So we can hear directly from many of the stakeholders who will be in charge of implementing and who will be, be, be most impacted by these proposals. Many of the regions, uh, many of the, these issues so surrounding federal electricity transmission uh, break down by region rather than by party. And I look forward to the question and answer segment to, lo to learn more about how Order 1000 uh, would affect my state, in the state of Illinois, specifically, as well as the uh, Midwest region in general. So I am very eager to hear the testimony from Chairman Willenhoff, as well as the other witnesses, and I look forward to a very informative, uh, uh, inspirational, educational, and robust discussion on these very important issues, Mr. Chairman, here today. It's so good to be back in the hearing with you once again. <laughs> Thank you. It'll Thank be inspiring. Of my time. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Rush. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rush always complains we don't have enough hearings. So uh, <laughs> this time I'd like to recognize the Chairman Emeritus of the full committee, uh, Mr. Barton of Texas, for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, it's very understandable you may not have heard the decision that Secretary Chu made since you have been doing such good work on the floor the last several weeks on so many issues. It's understandable that you might not have heard that he made the decision to keep the siting authority at, at the Department of Energy. But we want you to keep doing the good work and we'll send you notes as, as developments occur on these other issues. Um, let me say on the, on the siting issue that I think the Secretary made the right decision while I, I think it's reasonable for FERC to get the authority, given the fact that since the court case in Virginia several years ago, the Department of Energy has not exercised its authority that we gave them in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, there was a reason that we had a, um, a split responsibility. Uh, we, and I was the chairman of the conference committee, and we thought about it quite a bit. Uh, we wanted the Department of Energy as an independent agency to, to make a, um, let's say, a transparent decision that um, a certain corridor needed to have uh, uh, new transmission 
and then we wanted the FERC, uh, once that designation was made, to be responsible for, for working with the stakeholders and to develop the, uh, the actual permitting process and the, the, the specific siting process. We thought it was best to have two different groups uh, do each part of the process. Uh, since the court decision, the Department of Energy has not really tried to designate any new corridors, and I would encourage you, uh, Madam Senior Advisor, to work with the Secretary and the others in the Department. Uh, if you need uh, additional legislative language, I'm sure we can do that on a bipartisan basis. But I think the, the system in the current law will work uh, if, if we start to try to make it to work. Uh, the one thing that I did question about the request or the, the delegation is I think it's Congress's role to make those decisions, and I don't think the executive branch can just delegate the explicit authority given to it under, um, under law. With regard to FERC Order 1000, um, as Mr. Rush indicated, that's a fairly complicated piece of work. Um, as a past chairman of this subcommittee and also of the full committee, uh, I've been involved for over 20 years with these issues, and I can tell you folks here in the audience, and it's no surprise, they're very complicated. My main problem with FERC, FERC Order 1000 is that it appears that under certain conditions um, an entity could be forced to pay for something that they don't want to, to participate in, don't receive a benefit from, and yet they can still be forced to pay. I think that's a problem, and I think it need to be looked at, needs to be looked at. Overall, though, I think FERC Order 1000 uh, is an, a noble attempt to try to bring some order out of what has been a somewhat chaotic system um, with all the various RTOs and MSIOs and, and, and independent marketers and now, you know, still some parts of the country that are in regulated markets. Uh, it's a miracle that anything ever gets cited and anything ever gets done. So. Um, Mr. Chairman, it's good for you and Mr. Rush to be continuing these hearings. Uh, hopefully we'll shed some light on, on the issue. With that, I want to yield to Mr. Terry. I think he's got uh, unanimous consent. Yeah, I just thank you, Mr. Emerita, Chairman Emeritus. I do have, I ask for unanimous consent that I uh, may submit for the record the APPA letter report. Did you that objection. Thank you. Yield. And I'd yield to, to Mr. Shimkus for my final minute. And, and just to welcome the, the first panel uh, and concur with uh, uh, Mr. Barton's analysis, I served on the conference committee also in 2005. We, I know what our intent was. I know what the courts have ruled, which is against the intent of Congress for expedited citing. Uh, even if you believe in the new green world, you need new transmission and we need to be able to get cross state lines. So uh, I think there'll be a lot of folks in support of that. Uh, Chairman Wellinghoff, good to see you again. Um, I still have concerns with reliability if you want most of the coal plants in this country to be decommissioned. I also have concerns, as you know, on the uh, projection on the gigawatts, yours versus the EPA, as we discussed last time. And the transmission is another big key to this if we want reliability, we have to have transmission, so hopefully we'll be allies on this one, and I yield back my time. Jim, when you yield back his time. Um, I would also ask, uh, ask unanimous consent uh, to enter to the record of the statement of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association without objection, and at this time I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Waxman of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, not only for recognizing me, but for working with us on today's hearing on electric uh, transmission. This is a vital issue. Uh, one reason it's so important is the relationship between transmission and renewable energy. Renewable energy is one of the cornerstones of a clean energy economy. Over the next decade, the global clean energy market is going to be worth $2.3 trillion, and we cannot afford to surrender this market to China or other countries with aggressive clean energy policies. But to compete effectively, we will need to increase dramatically the amount of energy generated from renewable sources. The good news is that our nation has tremendous renewable resources. There are excellent wind resources in the middle of the country and substantial solar resources, particularly in the southwest. In fact, every region of the country has renewable resources that can be tapped to expand renewable energy generation and reduce carbon pollution. 
The challenge is that some of the best renewable sources are often located in remote areas, far from the cities and population centers that need clean electricity. And that, and that brings us to the issue of transmission. We are not going to achieve our job creation and pollution reduction goals without new transmission to connect our renewable resources to the electric grid. There is no question that transmission is not the only solution. Energy efficiency and other methods of reducing electricity demand will play a crucial role. Distributed clean energy generation is important, but I don't think anyone seriously questions the need for some new transmission lines if we are going to dramatically expand our use of renewable energy. In approaching this issue, we need to preserve a strong role for local and State interests and expertise, but we also need to ensure that important interstate transmission lines aren't blocked for purely parochial reasons. This is a tough issue. It is an issue that has been the subject of spirited debate during the past several uh, years. The uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recently tackled two key aspects of this issue in its Order 1000. FERC uh, staff submitted a separate proposal to the Department of Energy related to FERC's authority to cite certain transmission lines when States fail to do so. This is commonly referred to as Federal Backstop Citing Authority. Right now, the Department of Energy conducts studies of transmission congestion and then designates national interest electric transmission corridors. Within those corridors, FERC has authority to cite lines if the State permitting agency fails to act on a permitting application for one year. I opposed this provision in 2005, and I think the last six years have demonstrated that it was the wrong approach. It focused exclusively on congestion rather than on information, other information factors like reliability and expanding renewable generation. It was uh, structured in a way that interfered with the traditional authorities of State permitting agencies. There was no link to regional planning, and the Federal Backstop Siting Authority even applied to transmission that didn't cross State lines. Under the prior administration, DOE also abused the process by designating massive corridors that included whole States. FERC staff proposed that Secretary Chu delegate DOE's authority to FERC so that FERC could breathe a new life into this flawed provision. Yesterday, yesterday Secretary Chu decided not to delegate DOE's authority as FERC proposed. I think that was a right decision. However, Secretary Chu and Chairman Wellinghoff also announced that they will work together to improve implementation of this provision. Today's hearing is a good opportunity for the committee to um, uh, better understand the details of how this new approach would work. A broad range of views are represented on both today's panels, and I look forward to uh, the perspectives of our witnesses on FERC's efforts to improve transmission planning and lower cost allocation barriers uh, to build, building new transmission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. And uh, <clears throat> we have with us today the Honorable John Wellenhoff, who is Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission, and as I also stated, Ms. Lauren Azar, who is the Senior Advisor, Office Secretary of Energy at the Department of Energy. Welcome to both of you. We look forward to your expert testimony. And uh, Mr. Wellenhoff, I will recognize you for your five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rush and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here today. My name is John Wellinghoff, and I am the Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The development of an efficient electric transmission system benefits consumers by reducing barriers to trade within and among regions, thereby enhancing competition in wholesale electric markets. With this goal in mind and recognizing that significant transmission investment is likely to be made in the foreseeable future, the Commission recently issued Order No. 1000. Order 1000 revisits the Commission's transmission planning and cost allocation requirements to ensure that they are adequate to support more efficient and cost-effective transmission investment decisions moving forward. Through these changes, Order 1000 will foster competitive markets to benefit consumers, strengthen our national security, and help revitalize our economy. I would like to highlight three major points about Order 1000. First, Order Number 1000 emphasizes regional flexibility and regional action. 
Within a general framework, each transmission planning region determines its own transmission needs by building an open and transparent process that are already in place, <clears throat> by building upon an open and transparent process that's already in place, and in each region will propose cost allocation methods. Order 1000 does not establish preset regional boundaries, nor does it prescribe how those regions plan their systems. Nothing in Order 1000 requires either interconnect-wide uh, planning or interconnect-wide cost allocation. Second, Order 1000 states <coughs> that those who do not benefit from new transmission facilities should not pay. Third, Order 1000 is about establishing effective processes for trans transmission planning and cost allocation, not about requiring specific outcomes of those processes. Order 1000 does not favor renewable energy resources, nor would such a preference be consistent with the Federal Power Act or the Commission's open access transmission policy. Order 1000 does not require or subsidize the use of green energy. Order 1000 also recognizes the state's vital role in protecting consumers. Order 1000 recognizes the unique perspective that states can provide in regional transmission planning processes. Nothing in Order 1000 is intended to preempt or otherwise affect state laws or regulations with respect to construction of transmission facilities. Through the reforms adopted in Order 1000, the Commission seeks to ensure that the nation's electric grid is prepared to meet the challenges and realize the opportunities of the 21st century. Order 1000 will reduce the inefficiencies that exist today in today's transmission planning processes and the uncertainty created by the lack of clear cost allocation methods for regional and interregional transmission facilities. Effective regional transmission planning and interregional transmission coordination, along with cost allocation reforms as required by Order 1000, will help improve reliability, reduce congestion, increase the deliverability of existing power supplies, allow new domestic power supplies to be developed, and help ensure that consumers have greater access to efficient, lower cost electricity at just and reasonable rates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairman Willenhoff. Uh, Ms. Azar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rush. It's a pleasure to testify before you on the issue of utmost importance, upgrading our electric infrastructure. Today, I start my fifth month as Senior Advisor to Secretary Chu. The Secretary hired me primarily to accomplish one task, build new electric infrastructure. Transmission and storage are my focus. As an attorney involved with permitting of new transmission lines and a former commissioner at the Wisconsin Public Service Commission, I come from the trench trenches. Transmission is akin to mortar in a foundation. This nation requires a robust and resilient grid to connect its building blocks. You need look no further than your own briefcases to understand that our nation's demand for electricity is changing and doing so dramatically. How many gadgets do you carry that uh, require charging on a frequent basis? And when did you start carrying them? To propel this nation forward in the global economy, we must build a grid for the 21st century, and we must build it fast. Everyone knows the adage that Thomas Edison could understand the mechanics of our current grid. But what most don't realize is that our grid can be visualized as a plate balancing on top of a stick. When something's placed on one side of the plate, a weight of an equal amount must be placed on the other side to ensure stability. If too much counterweight is placed, then the, weight, then the plate topples. The plate is the grid. The weights and counterweights are generation and the demand for electricity. The placement of those weights and counterweights happens second by second. For about the last 130 years, we've built the infrastructure necessary to ensure the plate doesn't topple. While I'll talk today about the need for more transmission generally, and it sounds like this committee agrees with that, uh, this nation also needs to develop a new type of grid, one that can't be described by plates, sticks, and weights. While my written testimony discusses some of the barriers to building more transmission, I'd like to focus my comments on three things the DOE is currently doing to remove those barriers. The first, the power marketing administrations. The Department's PMAs are at the forefront of our transmission authorities. Bonneville Power, or BPA, owns more than 15,000 miles of transmission, and the Western Area Power Marketing Administration, or WAPA, owns 17,000. The Recovery Act provided both PMAs with resources to, among other things, build new transmission. Both are moving forward expeditiously, yet with due diligence to do just that. 
Section 1222 of EPAC 2005 granted authority to Western and Southwestern to partner with the private sector to construct and upgrade transmission facilities in their service territories. Both the borrowing authority and Section 1222 allow the Secretary through the PMAs to help build transmission. Secondly, the backstop siting, as has already been discussed in the opening statements. Earlier this week, Secretary Chu and Chairman Wellinghoff have announced they have agreed to collaborate in their implementation of the Federal Backstop Siting Law, which was also created in EPAC 2005. After vetting a proposal that he delegate his authorities to FERC, Secretary Chu declined to do so but is working with the Chairman to develop processes to make the law work more effectively. In addition to its collaboration with FERC, DOE recognizes that it can administer its 216A powers faster, better, with more transparency and more efficiently. Consequently, among other things, DOE will be doing the following. Identify targeted areas of congestion based on the evaluation of existing information and on comments submitted by stakeholders. Identify narrower congested areas than the broad areas that had been previously studied and solicit statements of interest from transmission developers while considering what national corridors to designate. Number three, the rapid response team for transmission. Just last week, the Obama administration announced it would accelerate the evaluation of seven proposed transmission applications. The RRTT leverages a nine-agency collaborative that was established through 2009 MOU. As an aside, that MOU was yet another authority, based on another authority granted in EPAC 2005, Section 216H. The nine agencies of the 2009 MOU have agreed to do the following and agree to the pilot projects. ID all federal agencies with jurisdiction over transmission, coordinate the calendars of those agencies, uh, establish milestones and target dates for permit evaluation, dedicate staff, and this may be one of the most important aspects of it, dedicate staff that is going to evaluate the transmission permit applications, and that staff is going to be trained in transmission issues such as transmission technologies, transmission economies, uh, and uh, the, how transmission is developed, and to create an online dashboard that will document the status. These seven projects will serve as demonstrations of the streamlined federal permitting and increase cooperation. In closing, as someone who is passionate about the need to modernize our grid, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate your testimony. Um, we actually didn't have an opportunity to read your testimony because it came in pretty late last night, but uh, thank you for going through it with us this morning. Um, Mr. Wellinghoff, uh, would I be correct in saying that one of the reasons for issuing Order uh, 1000 was a, re a result of the Illinois decision in the, F the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals? W w was that one of the um, reasons that you all decided to issue the Order 1000, or was that just one of the many reasons? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that court case was a, a reason for, for issuing Okay. Order 1000. Certainly, Order 1000 talks about costs and benefits, and the Seventh Circuit case talks about costs and benefits as well, but right. I'm not sure it was a reason okay. for issuing 1000. Well, one, one of the reasons I bring that up, I was reading in the, that decision, and the court made some references about the lack of uh, uh, analysis on benefits and uh, um, reliability and so forth, and, and as I was reading some of the comments of witnesses that will be on other, other panels, they were also talking about the lack of clarity in Order 1000 on establishing benefits and calculating benefits, and I was curious from your pr perspective, uh, do you feel like the Order 1000 is uh, is it valid to criticize Order 1000 on the lack of clarity of the way you determine benefits, or do you feel like that's something that you will address before it becomes final? Um, the order is final, although it's subject to rehearing. Uh, we certainly um, will look at those comments with respect to clarity, but it's sort of the glass half empty, the glass half full. Some people think there's not enough clarity. Other people think there's not enough flexibility. Okay. What we wanted to try to do is preserve as much flexibility as possible for the regions 
to ultimately determine uh, what they believed were appropriate benefits in their bucket of benefits for that particular region. So Order 1000 was structured in a way to give the regions maximum flexibility. There are some people who are asking for more clar clarity, but if, if we give more clarity, that means more direction from Washington, more oversight from Washington, and more specificity by us. And there's a lot of people who would then push back the other way on that. So, it, you know, it can go yeah. either way on that. Right. They're just trying to reach a fine balance, right? Yes. Um, would you describe how order number 1000 will impact utilities and stakeholders in traditionally regulated regions such as the Northwest and Southeast as opposed to organized wholesale markets? Well, I think it will be similar in, in the sense that, that, that both of those areas, uh, those, those distinct areas, will have to have regional planning authorities, and in fact they do. Even in the areas that do not have organized markets, the west, northwest that you talked about, southeast as well, they do have now regional planning authorities that could qualify on, under Order 1000 as part of the Order 1000 process. So I don't see that there will be specific large differences between the two. Uh, both areas will have to comply with the, with the, the premises of Order 1000. However, Order 1000, as I mentioned before, has sufficient flexibility so that those regions can tailor their regional activities to fit their regional needs. Okay. Ms. Azar, uh, you've been over there, I think you said five months maybe, is that right? Just completing four. Uh, when we talk about transmission needs of the country, uh, there are certainly are a lot of different studies about that. And what analysis do you or have you seen uh, since you've been at the Department of Energy that would reflect exactly how many transmission lines do we need, how many new ones do we need, and what is the condition of the transmission uh, infrastructure in the country in general, would you say? You know, we hear some criticism that uh, it's an old system, it's outdated, and uh, what, what is your analysis just from your professional experience in that area mm -hmm. about where do we really stand today on transmission needs in America? Uh, there are a variety of needs, and, um, I, you know, I don't rely on any one specific analysis because what I can tell you is any specific analysis is based on assumptions that our guess is for what the future looks like. And we know it's going to be wrong, right? But we need to figure out a way in which to build the infrastructure that is going to work in the most of our guesses with what the future looks like, the most robust, the most resilient, and the most flexible. Um, our, our needs are great not just to build transmission itself to convey the electrons, but we need a lot of different kind of technologies um, for the grid to make it more resilient uh, against things like what happened in San Diego. And I don't like to be an alarmist, but what happened in San Diego with regards to the blackout in Arizona, California, and Mexico should never have happened. That was, you know, we plan the electric grid to accommodate at least one bad thing happening. And one bad thing happened, but the grid went down there. And so that tells me that we do have issues more than just uh, meets the eye. And that was a result of one individual mistake being made, right? That is correct. Okay. And he was not intending harm. Okay. Mr. Rush, you recognize for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Wellenhouse, uh, what role does Order 1000 provide for uh, as it relates to uh, state regulators in the uh, regional transmission planning process? It actually provides for a robust role for state regulators. In fact, includes in there a provision for cost recovery for uh, allowances for state regulators to actually participate, their expenses participating. So we're, we're making every provision we can to ensure that they're included in the stakeholder <clears throat> as part of the stakeholder process. They're included in the process in regional planning. In fact, I've had discussions with state regulators and I explained to them that they, in fact, can decide what their region will look like. I mean, they, they are the ones who really have the power. I've really literally told them they have the power to determine how these regions are formed and what the regions will consist of. And so as such, uh, they, they, re they really can step up and, 
and, and, and take the ball and run with it. And we've given them that opportunity in Order 1000. So uh, what, have, what, have, what have been their uh, overall uh, general response? Are they uh, generally in favor of Order 1000? Or the, they... the ones I've talked to in the West have been pretty enthusiastic uh, about that idea because they have sort of flexible regions in the West that have changed over time. And so this is an opportunity, I think, for them to, to for the, some of the regulators in the, in the non-RTO regions in the West to take hold. In the East, they have already more established RTO regions, so usually those market regions are the planning authorities. And, and in fact, in those areas in the East, the regulators are participating uh, in, in those RTO regions uh, very, very heavily already. So, so they seem to be okay with it. Uh, and that would also include the, the Midwest, most of the Midwest also? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Order uh, 1000 relies heavily on regional transmission planning processes to develop and implement cost allocation methods for new transmission f facilities. Uh, how will FERC ensure that it does not delegate, delegate too much authority to regional stakeholders? Well, through, through a, a number of ways, certainly by the, the overall guidelines that we've set forth in Order 1000, by the review process that we have with respect to the plans, the, the planning processes that will come back and the cost allocation process that will come back, we have to approve those in a compliance order and also through the complaint process where if any of the regions are engaging in this planning in a way that goes outside of those boundaries, anyone can come to FERC file a complaint and we can resolve the issues as well. So we ultimately have the ultimate decision-making authority with respect to those activities, even though we've given the regions all this flexibility. I mean, we've let them go off and hopefully they can solve their own problems, but if they can't, FERC is the ultimate arbiter uh, of, the, uh, of the final activity there. Uh, uh, the courts have held that uh, Cost allocation methods must satisfy uh, the, and I quote, cost causation principle, uh, end of quote. Uh, can you explain uh, what your understanding of that principle is and how does the emphasis on beneficiaries in order uh, 1000 meet that test? Yes, I can. I can. Um, it's my understanding of the D.C. Circuit and also the Seventh Circuit case uh, have indicated that people who benefit can be, in essence, those cost causers. So to the extent, and again, we've made it very clear in the rule, to the extent that there are benefits, then costs can be allocated to individuals uh, that benefits are determined. But the de determination of those benefits, and this goes back to somewhat to the clarification question uh, of the uh, chairman, uh, the determination of those benefits and how those benefits will be structured will be up to the individual regions of how they'll determine what will actually be benefits. But, but there can be that causation link between costs and benefits, as I understand it, from a number of circuit court decisions. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. Now you are back to balance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rush. This time, uh, recognize Mr. Terry for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wellinghoff, help me, because uh, I'm uncertain uh, what a region is and how it's developed and is it all intrastate? Is it allowed under the order for states to band together? I, I just can't get my mind around the definition of region. Well, so work me through that. Certainly, I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, the way we've defined the re a region in the Order 1000 is pretty open. It, it allows the states to determine what they want to be a region. The minimum we've said, it's got to be at least two utilities. So you can't just have one utility be a region. You've got to plan with more than another utility. But ideally, it can be as large as PJM, which is a very large regional transmission organization that goes all the way from New Jersey to Chicago. Extremely large, 133,000 megawatts of power under control or it could be uh, as small as um, two utilities in the southeast. I believe that there's two or three utilities in the southeast that have decided 
to form themselves into a region. I think South Carolina and one uh, South Carolina um, Electric and Gas and one other utility, I believe, have decided to form themselves into a region. Uh, and again, this is ultimately with the approval and assent of the state public utility commissioners, those utility commissioners make determinations. But they can only do within the one state. So if it's multi-state, is that where FERC comes in and organizes? Well, no. Um, if it is, if it is within one state, it's still only related to right. interstate transmission and transmission in that state of a certain voltage and, and a certain that character and characteristic in nature is determined to be interstate transmission. So you could have you know, within one state, transmission that still is interstate transmission under FERC's jurisdiction. But with, but, but with respect to a utility's participation in that particular entity, a state commission is going to have a, a big say in that as well. Mrs. Zarr, do you, does DOE have any concerns about the unyielding nature of the definition of region? DOE is supportive of uh, the Order 1000. Uh, we think it's a good um, step towards getting transmission built. Um, as the chairman has indicated, uh, they had to weigh and balance a lot of different interests in this and are trying to give flexibility at the same time being um, prescriptive. Um, and I think uh, we will tell with, t we'll be able to tell with time uh, if they reach the balance appropriately that allowed us to build transmission. All right. Mr. Wellinghoff. Uh does uh, FERC 1000 allow for a preference in uh, energy depending on how it's generated? For example, will clean energy uh, have a preference over, let's say, coal-generated electricity? No. None at all? Even if the, re the, the region, the re excuse me, the regions will determine how to plan for the transmission they need, and that transmission will be driven by market forces. So whatever the market forces are, with respect to the particular resources that are developed in that region, those will be the resources that will get on those transmission lines. Okay. So there's no mechanism to say public policy requires that clean energy be used and... The, mar the, market, the market forces will be driven by market things like fuel prices and other um, characteristics, and also will be driven by both state and federal public policy determinations, as they are in all the states in this country. There are some 30-odd states that have renewable portfolio standards, for example. Those are, in essence, market forces that have been created by state legislatures that set forth certain resource decisions in the markets. Mrs. Are any comment? No, uh, there are not. I just, with regards to public policy, that public policy, when it's uh, required and mandated, is used in transmission planning to determine what sort of infrastructure we need, and whether it be, you know, a requirement that, uh, you know, we, um, compl the, the, a certain state complies with a renewable portfolio standard, that would be one thing that the utilities have to comply with. So in order to predict what the future looks like, you're going to assume that that's true. Um, same thing that if, uh, if for instance, uh, a state would come up with and say, look, you need to assume that clean coal technology is going to work and we're gonna, that's what our future is going to look like. Transmission uh, planning would incorporate that kind of public policy and Order 1000 requires that. Right. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Terry. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your courtesy and I commend you for this hearing. Uh, these questions to Mr. Wellinghoff. Uh, first, welcome. Uh, second, I hope you will answer these questions yes or no, because that will enable us to get a lot more on the record. Uh, one, does Order 1000 provide subsidies for renewable energy or transmission lines to carry renewable energy? Please ye answer yes no, or no. No. Uh, does Order 1000 provide incentive rates for renewable energy lines? No. Yes or no. Uh, by the way, thank you for your cooperation. No disrespect is intended here. Uh, I, I'm happy to, happy to answer for you. Does Order 1000 require anybody to pay for transmission for which they receive no benefit? Yes no, or no? No, no. Does Order 1000 require anybody to use or build renewable energy generation? Yes or no? No. 
My home state of Michigan has a renewable portfolio standard that must be met by in-state generation. In other words, a wind farm in South Dakota cannot be used to meet Michigan RPS requirements. Would a regional planning evaluations under Order 1000 take into account laws like that of Michigan? Uh, yes or no? It would be up, uh, that, that's a hard yes or no one. It would be up to the regional planning group to make that decision. Okay. Um, and wherever you, we get to the point where we have some difficulty on this yes or no, I would expect that you would submit some additional comments for the record, if you please. Be happy to do that, Mr. Dingle. Now, in Order 1000, FERC notes that after Order 890 was issued in 2007, conferences and requests for comments were held in 2009. Did these conferences or comments include discussions of issues that were ultimately included in Order 1000? I believe so, but I'll have to submit something to you on that to make sure. And again, I, I apologize for this, but time is so limited here. Uh, were public utilities allowed to participate in the conferences or requests for comments? I, I believe so. By delegating much of the responsibility for transmission planning and cost allocation to multiple and diverse regions, do you risk a dilution of consistence and supportable national energy policy? Is that a risk? I, I, I don't believe so, no. I believe that I have a lot of faith in the regions. I have, uh, and I and you, and, and I hope that you will feel free to add additional comments. Order 1000 states FERC's intention was not to disrupt the progress made with respect to transmission planning and investment in transmission infrastructure. However, isn't the act of requiring regions to develop inter and intra-regional planning processes disruptive? Or uh, there's an assumption in your premise of your question that's incorrect. Order 1000 does not require inter-regional planning. Okay, and I don't want you to be hesitant about disagreeing with me if you do. Claims have been made on both sides of this issue that the policies in Order 1000 will either greatly increase rates on consumers or will help keep rates down. Which do you think will be the case? I think it will improve efficiencies and keep rates down. Uh, well, you've, we have completed this in one minute, and, or rather we have, we have a minute and 15 seconds. Uh, Ms. Azar, do you have any comments to make on the points that we have just had? No, thank you, sir. Um, uh, Mr. Willinghoff, um, the, the statutory authority for Order 1000, is that the Federal Power Act or is that other uh, enactments that we have made, such as some of the conservation energy legislation that we have passed since uh, in the last couple of years? It is the Federal Power Act, sir. Only? Yes. Okay. Um, do you need additional statutory authority to make this work or to enforce that properly or to see to it that the process goes forward? I do not believe so. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back 20, uh, 26 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dingle. <laughs> Mr. McKinley, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I haven't had a chance uh, to read your 620 pages of this order yet. Uh, but from what I can gather, uh, everyone else is going to have trouble understanding that as well. Uh, and some of the questions that have already come up um, suggest there are still a lot of questions. That, that, like the regional planning. In your testimony, you say that it does not establish regional boundaries, but yet in the testimony, you said there have to be regional planning. Who, who's going to set that? I'm a little confused, just like uh, Congressman Terry, uh, as to who sets these boundaries. Are these going to be like the football conferences that they each, they all, they keep changing all the time? Uh, um, can we have overlapping conference uh, uh, regions? Uh, I, I thought I gathered a little of that earlier. Can you describe just a little bit about what those councils could be, these planning groups? If it's not set up, who sets them up? The companies themselves? These two companies? 
to my knowledge, everywhere in the country, these are already set up. In some places, they're part of <clears throat> the processes of the organized wholesale markets, the regional transmission organizations or the independent system operators. In other places where those don't exist, and there's, <clears throat> there's um, six of those under our jurisdiction, where they don't exist, um, which is primarily the South East and the West, except for California, uh, they have the states and the utilities and the transmission owners and other stakeholders have already formed themselves largely into regions. Um, but if the state utility commissioners or other so is West Virginia, which, which one are we in? Which region are we in then, if you say that I, they're I, already... I, I believe you're in PJM. And PJM would be? A regional transmission organization that goes all the way from New Jersey to Chicago. Okay. Um, it's been in now, place for many, you, one many, of many your, years. One of your answers I, I found was interesting. You said, if, uh, because it was back to... Um, Congressman Dingell's uh, answer, you said there's no subsidy, but I, I'm a little confused about it, and I can help me out here with this, because of the Caperton article that came out in July. So what you're saying is that if prior to renewables, the cost is X to the customers in West Virginia, but then when we bring renewables on and it becomes cost X plus something else, isn't that a subsidy? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the Caperton article. Well, the article, the Cap it was it was published in in July 28th, and it said this is going to be the that your your ruling will be the most progressive clean energy action the federal government will take this year, resulting in the thousands of miles of new line to bring renewable energy to your home. Um, I'm not opposed to new energy, but I think that we all have. You said there's no subsidy, but it sure smells to me like in these 620 pages that there's a subsidy in here somehow for renewable energy, because if the cost prior to renewables is is X, it's going to increase once we put a new transmission line into a uh, a wind farm. That that cost is going to increase. So why isn't that a subsidy? Is that just Washington talk? Mr. McKinley, I've read all 620 pages, and I can assure you there's no subsidy in there for renewables. If their cost goes up by having renewables, because we're putting a line in for a wind farm, and now I have to pay more, why is that not a subsidy? The, the, again, I take you back to the 620 pages. There's nothing in there with respect to one this kind of... This is about the definition of benefit? No, um, it's not about the definition of benefit at all. It's, it's, it's ultimately about what's in the 620 pages, which has nothing to do with a uh, particular resource. It has to do with planning and allocation of uh, transmission costs. Congressman, can I uh, weigh Please. in on here? I just wanted to point out in PJM alone, um, the uh, lack of transmission cost your constituents and the other constituents in PJM $1.4 billion dollars in 2010 alone. And um, by building more transmission and getting um, the system to be more efficient, we're not going to be letting that money on the table anymore. And so uh, there's ways in which uh, you know, money is going to be saved as we're bringing on uh, a new generation that's moving us into the new economy. Maybe fine. I, I, I'm just trying to understand the effect. Obviously, Terry has raised yep. this issue. I'm trying to understand yep. what the likelihood of increased cost is going to be under 1,000 to the residents of West Virginia. I actually think Wellington, it's going to go down. Wellington, can you explain, can you tell me, is it likely, what, what, what's the cost going to be to I, the residents? I, I think, as, as Ms. Azar has indicated, to the extent that we can reduce congestion in West Virginia, we can provide access to West Virginia to lower cost resources, ultimately, your costs will be lower. 1,000, so order 1,000 is going to, you think is going to lower utility costs. Order 1,000 will allow for the planning and cost allocation of efficient transmission. Efficient transmission can, in fact, lower costs. Do you think it will? Well, I, I, can, I can give you one particular example in, in northern New Jersey, for example. I don't care about northern New Jersey. Well, it, it's an example. I asked about West Virginia, <laughs> first district of West Virginia. I, I, again, efficient transmission and, and, and markets will lower your costs. 
gentleman's time's expired. Uh, maybe we can do it later, Morgan. Mr. Griffith, you're recognized for five minutes. Our districts don't touch, but I'm in the same uh, neighborhood as uh, Mr. McKinley, so I do have concerns there because, you know, it's hard to get cheaper than what we used to have, uh, and I understand some of the environmental concerns. And if I understood you correct, Mr. Wellinghoff, the 620 pages, and I, like Mr. McKinley, have not had an opportunity to get through all 100, 620 pages of it, but as I understand from your testimony previously, the 620 pages doesn't have anything to do with that. That has to do with public policy decisions made at the state and federal level. Is that is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't doesn't understand. It, the fact that, that if costs go up because we're bringing in uh, renewable energy and new sources of energy, uh, that's not because of your transmission line. If I understood your testimony correctly, that's not because of the transmission line or the 620 pages of, of Rule 1000, Order 1000 but because of other public policy decisions made by the, uh, the state and federal governments. Any public policy decisions that influence the markets will influence the costs in those markets. All right. So let me ask you, if we're building a small wind farm on top of a mountain in my district, who pays for that electricity to get to the grid? Is that something that, that is paid for by the developer of the wind farm, or is that going to be picked up by the region? And I'm also in... I always get the initials backwards, but PJM. If it's a Gentile line, a line going from the wind farm into a um, particular uh, transmission line, which Gentiles are not part of Order 1000, then the developer will pay for the line. Okay. Now, uh, apparently in March you stated that I believe that additional federal authority with respect to transmission planning, siting, and cost allocation would significantly increase the likelihood that those needed facilities will be constructed in a timely manner. In Order 1000, you assert that FERC already has this authority, and, uh, and you indicated in answering to uh, Mr. Dingell that the authority came out of the Federal Power Act, and I'm wondering, just so I can save myself a lot of time, where will I find that authority in the Federal Power Act, and was it there before and you hadn't stumbled across it, or is there, what's different between now and March? I'm sorry, what specific authority are you referring to? Okay. Mr. Dingell asked you about the authority to, uh, right. to do the things that you need it's to under do. under the Federal Power Act, but right. I didn't understand the first part of your question. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm looking at a statement here that was given to me that, that says that in uh, March you testified that I believe that additional federal authority with respect to transmission planning, siting, and cost allocation would significantly increase the likelihood that those needed facilities would be constructed in a timely manner. And I'm just wondering, guide me through how I make the, how I reconcile March to now. Okay, that's, that's a fair question, and I'm, and I'm, and I, and I'm not certain, I'll tell you quite frankly, I'm not certain what my uh, reference was there. I perhaps re was referring to the issue of siting, which is not under Order 1000. Order 1000 only relates to planning and cost allocation. There's been a lot of discussions about siting back and forth, the recent decision by Secretary Chu and others. So I may have been referring to siting specifically. Okay. And maybe we can have a conversation later, sure. or maybe we can figure out how you can rectify that. I'd be happy so to that, do that. Yeah, because... It's I'm not trying to get a gotcha. I'm just trying to sort it all out because no. I'm one of those people that, you know, I may not get to it today, but I'm going to read through the 620 pages at some point, and, I, and it would save me a lot of time instead of having to read through the whole Power Act and figure out what, what part gives you authority if you could get somebody to get me a site for that. So I can uh, read that as well. I'd appreciate it. be happy it. to do that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll yield back my time. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Ms. Azar, I want to just ask you one question. You you'd made a comment about moving into the new economy, and would you just explain to us what is your perspective of the new economy? Well, the new economy includes things like this, that we're powering up, and it's a, likely a dramatic increase in the use of electricity through electric vehicles, through continued development of gadgets like this. Um, and also, Things like cybersecurity, where we want to make sure that our grid is resilient and strong and that we're competing with, um, able to compete with the global economy. So we need a resilient grid. We need, uh, you know, good resources, and uh, we need it to be at a reasonable cost. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Shimkus, do you have, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. I had to uh, 
go to the floor and spend five minutes talking about Yucca Mountain, which is another favorite topic of mine. Um, I know, Mr. Wellinghoff, you understand that. The, uh, in, uh, the, uh, just some general questions uh, to the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, do you have any uh, views on FERC order number 1,000? Yes. Um, in general, the Department of Energy supports uh, FERC order 1,000 as a good step forward in trying to get transmission built. I think time is going to tell whether or not uh, it's sufficient. Uh, we, uh, it, they tried to balance some very difficult interests there. In, the, in your testimony, you, talk, you uh, identify that it takes about 10 years to build transmission and approximately three years to build new generation facilities. I've been a member 15 years. I still got some generation facilities that we're trying, we're trying to get built. So I don't know where those. Maybe that's after all the permitting and. Uh, it just depends on what the generation yeah. is. I mean, natural gas and um, uh, you know certain kinds of renewables can be built very quickly. Um, nuclear base load uh, coal plants take much longer. The what um, implications do the differing development periods have on resource planning? In other words, you got 10 and 3. Significant differences. Um, you know, transmission plan, usually when people are doing planning, it's a lot easier to plan in the near term than the long term. And so when you're thinking about some dramatic changes um, in, um, you know, how our energy is going to move, how our populations are going to move, how our economy is going to move, um, it's a lot more difficult to predict where we're going to be in the future. And so when you're thinking about transmission and it takes so much longer to build transmission, you're looking in the far term. And so predicting with accuracy is not something that, frankly, is a goal. Predicting, um, um, you know, essentially designing a system that's going to accommodate a lot of different hypothetical futures is what we do in transmission. That's not what you do when you're, you're planning and when you're trying to decide what kind of generation to build and where to build that. And why I'm going down this line of, of, of questioning is that we do know with the clean air interstate transport rule mm -hmm. or transport rule, whatever the name of it is, the, uh, that there is generation that's going to be retired. In fact, there's an announcement in Illinois to coal-fired power plant to go offline about uh, 600 megawatts in total that will be not available for, as in the last hearing, uh, base load generation. I think it affects reliability concerns. The, uh, uh, but it sounds like we may be able to build at least some new generation in the near term, but new transmission lines to connect this generation, as you were just answering, could be put off. No, no, I didn't say put off. It, it's just the, 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 there's there's a disconnect between the planning horizons, which actually creates difficulties. It doesn't mean transmission should be put off. It's actually the exact opposite, because transmission takes so long to plan and build. We need to do it now so that we can accommodate new generation. And, and that's a better way to put it. And I appreciate it. I'm trying to the balance. But with that disconnect, that does affect reliability. I mean, if you have generation, you don't have transmission. I mean. Uh, the whole base load debate. I think you and I are using the term reliability differently. Okay. Um, with regards to how reliable the system is, that's exactly what we, um, that's why we do the planning. But the disconnect, the disconnect between the, the building of new generation and the trans, transmission lines can cause problems. It can ca cause difficulties, correct. Okay. Do you believe the Ninth Circuit decision in the California Wilderness Coalition versus DOE impaired your the DOE's ability to carry out its duties under Section 216 of the Federal Power Act? I think we need to do it differently, and we are doing it differently. And what do you believe are the primary barriers to building uh, transmission in this country? How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I got 48 seconds. All right. So, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different barriers. It depends on the different regions. And uh, I set forth just some of them in my written testimony. I apologize that I didn't get it to you sooner, but uh, we didn't have enough uh, notice for getting it in on time. Um, with regards to um, um, the barriers, things like market power, things like um, you know uh, the lack of willingness of load serving entities to want to si sign power purchase agreements for merchant generation for merchant generation for us to allow to do the proper planning is another one. Um, yeah, you keep looking at the clock, which makes me more and more nervous. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you, sir, offline or submit co further comments. On the no, line. we appreciate it. Thank okay. you for your time. You go back.
Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Green, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to our panel. Chairman Willinghoff, Texas has led the way in identifying competitive renewable energy zones and ensuring the development of adequate transmission infrastructure to bring the new renewable resources from those renewable rich zones to the concentrated loads in our urban area. Is it fair to say that Order 1000 uh, provides a structure for other regions of the country to likewise identify and build transmission infrastructure that is needed to bring renew new renewable resources online? Mr. Green, I would uh, agree that Texas is a great model. You have done a great job down there in Texas, even though FERC has no jurisdiction with respect to transmission planning cost allocation in Order 1000. We're, we're all does familiar not, with ERCOT. <laughs> that does not apply to, to Texas specifically. Uh, but certainly uh, the types of things that Texas has done with its CRES zone activity and the building of $5 billion worth of transmission in Texas uh, are, are the types of things that other regions could look at. Uh, they'll have that opportunity uh, in planning processes and, and uh, processes that are, uh, are set forth and, and structured in Order 1000 for those other, other regions, yes. Okay. Transmission development is done incredibly well, as you said, in Texas using your regional approach. Are you surprised at, uh, by some of the criticism of the order? Well, there's always going to be criticism to anything that uh, is suggested uh, from a federal regulatory standpoint. Again, we are trying to give as much flexibility to those regions as possible. Uh, and sometimes giving flexibility, you get criticism coming back the other way, as uh, indicated from the, the question of the chairman earlier about, uh, about clarity. If you, if, you, if you give too much flexibility, think, people think you're not being clear enough. And if you give too much clarity, people think you're being too restrictive. So again, we're trying to strike a balance, trying to give the, those regions that, that balance they need to, to do what they need to do to ensure uh, they get the transmission built to economically uh, reduce costs for consumers. Well, and I know and we've done great with wind growth of wind power in West Texas, but it doesn't do any good in West Texas. The customers are in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Galveston, San Antonio, Austin, or the Rio Grande Valley. So that, uh, that commitment there is there. Mr. Transeth, who will be testifying on our next panel on behalf of the Coalition for Fair Transmission Policy Rights at FERC Order 1000 is efficient, so not so much on what it says, but more what it doesn't say. Under the order, the Commission delegates to regions the ability to determine how transmission planning will be conducted and how costs will be allocated, with very little, if any, guidance on the parameters of such important decision. Mr. Transit also writes, in particular, the order provides no guidance to regions on how benefits should be defined, thus leaving open the real, very real possibility regions can adopt extremely broad definitions and result in unfounded conclusions that everyone benefits from new transmission and should all pay, thus socializing the uh, transmission cost. What do you say to this criticism from that? Well, FERC will provide the ultimate guidance to the extent that a particular region can make decisions can't arrive at their own decisions with the flexibility that we've given them, we, it will fall back to FERC to ultimately set forth a, a cost allocation methodology and, and make those decisions. And we've made that clear in the order. So um, again, I, I think the criticism is unfounded because again, we do try to give the regions the amount of flexibility and the amount of, um, uh, of room that they need to do what they need to do for the regions. But again, if that clarity and preciseness is needed in the sense that they can't make the decision themselves within the structure that we've given in Order 1000, then ultimately when those compliance plans come in showing that they haven't made a decision, FERC will make the decision for them. I don't relish that. I don't think that's the, the, the best way to do it. But uh, again, that is the ultimate uh, end of the line uh, where the buck stops with FERC. For the most part, our Texas grid is regulated under the ERCOT and RTO that is actually regulated at the state level and not by FERC. A small part of Texas falls in the Southwest Power Pool, though, and it's my understanding that SPP first began its process for determining its regional planning process uh, shortly after FERC first proposed its regional planning and, uh, and cost allocation rule in 2010. Was SPP methodology approved by FERC? We set some parameters out in order uh, 890 with respect to planning. So to that extent, and they, they did file a compliant, compliance plan for order 890. So to that extent, we did review their planning process 
We certainly haven't reviewed the one that would be under Order 1000 as of yet, but I, and I believe you've got uh, uh, Nick Brown from uh, SPP who's going to testify here before you today. Yeah. Uh, have any other RTOs sent updated planning and cost allocation methodology to FERC for approval since the rule was first proposed in 2010? And if so, were those approved? Uh, was there pushback in the region on the methodology, et cetera? Uh, first of all, I guess, is that uh, uh, were updated plans um, and cost allocation submitted to FERC? There have been some submitted, some are pending before us, which I can't talk about because they're pending well, cases before us, but there have been some submitted, yes. Some have been approved? I believe some have been approved, but there are a number that are pending right now before us as well. And the last thing, although I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, has there been pushback on the, on the methodology? C certainly there's been uh, differing sides on the methodology, and again, that's what FERC does is we, we, we resolve those issues as to the, the d differing positions on particular methodologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you as well to the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Wellinghoff, a, a question for you. Are you familiar with uh, the cap-and-trade legislation that passed Congress, uh, passed the House a couple years ago? No, I'm not. Are you familiar, were you familiar with any of the amendments that were added to it in terms of uh, transmission siting issues, uh, the manager's amendment? I don't believe so, no. Uh, there was an amendment that was added in the negotiations at, at the end of the process, and I'll read you a summary of the amendment. It basically it passed uh, onto the bill. It provided FERC with siting authority for the construction of certain high-priority interstate transmission lines constructed in the Western Interconnection and amended the National Interstate Electric Transmission Corridor. Uh, the DOE FERC delegation proposal, is that uh, the same kind of idea? Is that, what's ha is that what happened? If, not, if you aren't familiar with that amendment, perhaps you could get back to me and... Uh, I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Uh, thank you very much. And then uh, I'll be asking this question later as well to some other witnesses, but uh, it is my understanding that the, the order, the FERC order uh, 1000, uh, requires each public utility uh, transmission provider to participate in a regional transmission planning process. Uh, while some regions of the country have regional transmission organizations that could run such a process, uh, others do not. Uh, could you explain to me how the regional planning requirement would work for states like Colorado that aren't part you, of the RTO? Could you explain to me which ones don't have, have was to run? My, like my understanding is every everyone, Colorado, in fact, is is in one of the western regional planning entities. I'm not sure which, if there's a couple out there, I'm not sure which one it's in, but in fact, they, they are already in one and they're, they're, they're already conducting regional planning. Well, perhaps I can get back to the further details of the question. Sure. It's, it's my understanding from a number of the public utility providers that they are not right now in an RTO. Well, they're not in an RTO, but they're in a regional planning entity. There are regional planning entities. RTOs and regional planning entities aren't necessarily the same thing. Just RTOs, a lot of RTOs do the regional planning, but in other areas where they don't have RTOs, they just have regional planning okay. entities that, in essence, are an informal group of utilities who come together with stakeholders, including state commissioners and transmission owners and uh, consumers and others that participate in these processes. There's one called West Connect and, uh, and there's uh, Columbia Grid and there's a number of other ones in the West and I believe, uh, I, know, I know that Colorado is well, a Perhaps we can follow up with your office a little bit more sure. about this question because yeah. there are some concerns from uh, my constituents. Okay. Uh, you'll back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Bird, just for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Mr. Willinghoff, um, kind of following up on, on what Mr. Gardner was asking, the, the regional planning entity, Texas, as I understand it, is sort of its own regional planning entity. Is that correct? Uh, ERCOT is the regional planning entity, and in fact, they're, again, outside of our jurisdiction and not under Order 1000. Yeah, as it should be. Um, <laughs> well, and just to follow up on some of the stuff that Mr. Green was, was asking, uh, are there implications for Texas about the, uh, about the rule that's being discussed this morning. So ERCOT is outside, but there are other areas that, that will be affected? There's a very small, small piece, I believe, that it is in SPP uh, that will be, that is already part of the SPP planning process and participates and will be affected to the extent that they're part of, part of what, it, what SPP already does and then what SPP needs to conform to vis-a-vis uh, vis uh, Order 1000. Now, one of the things that we see happening 
in Texas is, of course, all of the wind occurs in places where people don't live, and people live in places where the wind doesn't blow. So getting the power from the wind farms in West Texas to the population centers in the Metroplex requires an east-west transmission line, which essentially is going to bisect my district. Now, is that the planning for that, is that all handled at the state level through the Public Utility Commission? In Texas? In Texas. I, I'm, I believe so, but I'm not that familiar with. But so FERC is not involved in the, in the. No. There's not a federal role in the siting of, no. those, of those transmission lines. No. It occurs at the state level. That's correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to, in the interest of the committee, I'll yield back the balance of my time. You're so kind. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Mr. Walden, you recognize for five minutes. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing. I've got uh, a couple of questions here. Um, picking up a bit on what uh, my colleague from Colorado asked about uh, the western regions. Now, it, it's my understanding non-jurisdictional utilities such as municipalities and the Bonneville Power Administration have raised uh, various concerns on rehearing of FERC's Order 1000. Specifically for BPA, the uh, Transmission System Act of 1974 charges the BPA administrator with determining what transmission investments are necessary and appropriate. BPA has also expressed concerns to FERC that this responsibility is non-delegable. Also, BPA's capital is limited. The administrator is required to include proposed expenditures in his budget submission to the Congress. BPA has expressed concerns to FERC that obligations of its capital must be decided upon by the administrator consistent with that statutory budget process. So, uh, Mr. Wellinghoff, can you assure me the Commission will thoroughly consider and be responsive to these concerns? I can assure you that. You can? Yes. Good. Thank you, sir. And as you know, the Pacific Northwest has implemented extensive and transparent transmission planning processes that have identified several transmission um, lines that need to be built to address transmission congestion and reliability issues. These lines are in the process of being approved and built. This is all uh, being done without an RTO. Will the Commission be flexible under its order and allow the existing regional planning processes in the West to address the transmission needs of all their utilities and customers? Those regional entities that are conducting that, that planning are certainly open to do that, yes. So your, uh, your order will allow that to continue? I believe so. <laughs> Um, as a Westerner, you know that 50 percent of the West is owned by the federal government, well, controlled by the federal government, and the single greatest obstacle to building transmission in the West is the difficulty of doing so on federal lands. What can FERC do to overcome this obstacle? Because a lot of these lines, these companies are looking at putting in, they're just saying, ha, I'm not even going to waste my time going over, over here on the federal ground. It's just too difficult, cumbersome, it's litigated. So then they try and take it on the private ground, which, of course, causes a few issues with farmers who are having to give up a couple hundred feet on each side of these big lines of prime farm ground, or they try and run it right in front of the uh, Oregon Trail Interpretive Center windows. <laughs> Can you give us some help here? Is the administration open to doing anything to help on the, the federal land to expedite the uh, issues we face there on siting? By the way, I'm hearing the same thing. Uh, on, uh, on the fiber side with the BTOP grants. I met with a recipient of one of the uh, grants to build out fiber, and it's the Forest Service and the permitting process, and it's this and it's that. Seems like every intersection with the federal government becomes more dangerous and slow and congested. Congressman, can I answer that? You may. Wonderful, and uh, thank you for the question, because uh, we have set up the rapid response team for transmission, which is precisely addressing that issue, which is to uh, make the federal permitting process for transmission lines uh -huh. uh, much more expedited. And it's, not, it's the application of the statutes are still going to happen, but we can do it better, we can do it faster, and we're going to. All right. So if we have specific instances, we could contact you and absolutely. See how I can give rapid, you my number. Rapid response I'll give you my team cell phone. can respond. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Um, as a practical matter, utilities in the Pacific Northwest need to coordinate uh, interregional transmission planning with the Bonneville Power Administration, a non-jurisdictional federal entity. Does FERC anticipate the BPA will fully participate in the interregional planning process under Order 1000? Uh, certainly, they're encouraged to do so. I can't, I can't speak for Steve Wright or what BPA will actually do, but they're certainly encouraged to do so, and we would hope they would. 
And will transmission projects that are taken through a regional or interregional cost allocation process be given special consideration by FERC for incentive rates? There, we, we have a pending incentive rate docket open right now. Um, I, can't, I can't say one way or the other. Okay. I have no bonus question for this round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Rush, I understand you have one additional question from Ms. Azar. Uh, yes, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your consideration. Ms. Uh, Azar, uh, are you familiar with the <coughs> two plants in Illinois uh, that will be shutting down? Uh, and I, I, I've been told that the two plants are uh, 70 years old, run on it sporadically over the last few years because they are the least efficient in uh, Ameren's uh, fleet and do not produce electricity uh, cheap enough to sell in uh, a weak power um, uh, market. So uh, is, do you agree that that's the real reason? You know, shutting down. Uh, Ranking Member Rush, w plants shut down all of the time, and um, a number of plants right now are uh, it being mothballed or they're folks waiting for the phone to ring, and the phone doesn't ring because they're not economic. Ironically, it is oftentimes the owners of those very uneconomic plants that don't want transmission to be built. And the reason for that is they can't compete in a competitive market. So as a consequence, you may hear it in the terms of, oh, the cost-benefit analysis can't be done uh, appropriately, or you know they're going to be socializing the costs. The bottom line is, if you really want real competition, some of these guys don't want it because they're going to lose. And um, I, you know I can't speak to the two plants in Illinois. I don't know them. You know my home state is Wisconsin. I can tell you, when I was a commissioner, we took a very hard look at what some of the plants that uh, needed to be shut down because they were un uneconomic. So. Okay, that concludes the first panel. Uh, we thank you all again for being with us. And at this time, I'd like to call up the witnesses on the second panel. We have with us uh, the Honorable Greg White, who is the commissioner with the public, uh, the Michigan Public Service Commission. We have the Honorable Philip Jones, who is a commissioner with the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. We have Mr. John Distasio, general manager and CEO of Sacramento Municipal Utility District, who's here on behalf of the Large Public Power Council. We have Mr. Stephen Transith, who's the principal with Transith and Associates, who's testifying on behalf of the Coalition for Fair Transmission Policy. We have Mr. Nicholas Brown, who's President and CEO of Southwest Power Pool. And we have Mr. Joseph Welsh, who is Chairman, President, and CEO, ITC Holdings Corporation. <clears throat> so I want to welcome all of you. We appreciate your joining us this morning, and we look forward to your uh, testimony and uh, the information that you'll provide. Each one of you will be given five minutes to make an opening statement. And uh, so, Mr. White, we'll call upon you to begin if you would uh, be recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, uh, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify regarding issues of critical importance to citizens of Michigan. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to present the views that the Michigan Public Service Commission has expressed concerning the issues surrounding cost allocation proposals for transmission projects and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission FERC Order Number 1000 and the impacts to state planning processes. Let me begin by emphasizing uh, our recognition of the importance of the development of strategic transmission resources as critical to the further development of markets and the reliable, reliable operations of the nation's transmission system. My state has committed thousands of hours in staff time and in commissioner time working in various regional planning uh, processes 
We are uh, in the MISO, Midwest Independent System Operator uh, RTO. We are also in the PJM RTO, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland. And we have committed, again, th uh, thousands of hours of staff and commission time. Um, my testimony today can really be boiled down simply to the concern that the allocation of costs to utility customers properly reflect the benefits the customers may receive. In other words, the cost, allocate, cost allocated must be aligned with the benefits. Under Sections 205 and 206 of the Federal Power Act, the FERC is charged with ensuring that the rates, terms, and conditions for transmission of electricity and interstate commerce are just, reasonable, and not unduly discriminatory or preferential. This has been interpreted by the FERC and the courts to mean that the cost of transmission facilities must be allocated in a manner that satisfies the cost causation principle that all approved rates reflect to some degree the costs actually caused by the customer who must pay them. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit explained that compliance with this principle is evaluated by comparing the costs assessed against a party to the burdens imposed or benefits drawn by that party. The Michigan Commission does not believe that the cost allocation proposals considered in our region satisfy the cost causation principle, and we're very concerned that the allocation of cost to Michigan could far exceed any benefits that the state would receive from most of these projects. In particular, it's important to recognize Michigan's unique peninsular geography and therefore its limited electrical interconnection to the rest of the MISO and PJM transmission system. As a result of geography and limited interconnections, it's likely that Michigan will realize minimal benefits from distant transmission expansion projects constructed in other states. However, on the basis of electric load, Michigan will be exposed to a disproportionate share of approximately 20% or more of all of these costs. It's clear that my state will not benefit from, uh, generally from the construction of all transmission lines in the Midwest or that Michigan receives benefits that are commensurate with such allocation of costs. The Michigan Commission's concern with FERC Order 1000 is, again, that the method used for determining the allocation of costs for these transmission projects selected to fulfill interregional planning is just and reasonable and reflective of the benefits that would be ascribed to Michigan's unique circumstances. In addition, the Michigan Commission believes individual transmission projects should be periodically reviewed in order to enable the FERC to strike an appropriate balance between consumer and investor interests. The final item I'd like to bring up, uh, my testimony was filed at 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Uh, at about 1 p.m. on Tuesday afternoon, the announcement came out that the, uh, the DOE had elected not to designate the FERC uh, with the responsibilities for the National Corridor uh, designation. And so I'd just like to, to point out that uh, the announcement uh, in that joint statement between the DOE and the FERC we, we view that as a positive development. While the details of this proposal will be critical, we appreciate that Energy Secretary Chu has given strong weight to the concerns raised by the states and numerous other parties. State public service commissioners understand as much, if not more than anyone else, about the importance of modernizing our nation's electrical system. And we are working across state boundaries to ensure that needed transmission is built in a timely manner uh, to benefit all customers, consumers, and that everybody has a voice. And so this is a welcome development. We look forward to working with the Department of Energy and the firm. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, before we go to the next witness, I have a UC request. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Matsui is not on the subcommittee, but she's interested in asking questions of uh, this second panel, and one of her constituents will be testifying. So my unanimous consent request is that Representative Masui be allowed to participate in the questioning of witnesses. Well, without objection, and of course we have the rule of the committee that <clears throat> she will have to wait until all the members of the subcommittee ask their questions, and we'd be happy to uh, do that. I think she will comply with that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Jones, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you. Uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, uh, former Ranking Emeritus Chairman Dingell, good to see you again. Members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on federal transmission issues and transmission issues affecting the Western interconnection in general, which have been mentioned in the previous panel, and the Pacific Northwest region and my state in particular. During my six years as a commissioner, I have been active uh, in energy issues in the Western interconnection and as a member of the committee on regional electric power cooperation in the West, an entity which I describe in my testimony, which has a long history of three decades, three decades of voluntarily cooperating to enhance electric power cooperation in the West. In my testimony, I include a map of the NERC interconnections. You may want to look at that. Uh, Representative Gardner, there have been some questions about regions and NERC and electric reliability regions, planning regions, and other regions. It is a complicated area, and each, each kind of reliability and economic in this new Order 890 have created new planning entities, and they're all a little bit different. But I think the bedrock of the planning is the reliability organizations that is governed by NERC. As I said, CREPC, this Committee on Regional Electric uh, Power Cooperation, has been active in the West for years. It's voluntary. Uh, we think we're doing a good job in the West because outside of California and the Cal ISO, we are generally what we call a vertically integrated market, uh, where the generation and transmission is owned by the same utility. The Western region has been planning for renewable energy generation and integrating that into the grid. Uh, the WRES, the Western Renewable Energy Zones, which I describe in my testimony, have been active for years. We've been working on integrating that renewable energy into the grid. And we, are, we, we commend the DOE and the FERC staff, both commissioners and staff, attend our meetings. And now, of course, we have the interconnection-wide funded effort by DOE to look at the interconnection-wide efforts. So there's a maze of acronyms. There's a maze of planning entities and I'd be happy to clarify on questions what they all do. The role of Bonneville, as was described earlier, and, and maybe if Congressman Walden comes back, we can get into that more. That's critical in our region. Bonneville owns 75 percent of the, of, of the high-voltage system in our region. But under Bonneville, we have two what we call sub-regional groups, uh, Columbia Grid and the Northern Tier Transmission Group, what we call NTTG. And these have been engaged in planning for the region since actually Order 890. So again, this is not new. Order 890 required even Colorado, it included Colorado and all the regions of the country to start planning. Uh, the other uh, development is WEC. This is uh, what I showed you on reliability. Our reliability organization came out with a 10-year plan just two weeks ago for transmission. The bottom line summary conclusion of that was no new transmission in the WEC region is needed by 2020 either to meet demand or to meet RPS needs. So again, transmission, as you know, can be driven by reliability issues, RPS needs, or load. The WEC study indicated that no new transmission is needed. However, they are now conducting a 20-year plan to look at the needs way into the 2030 region, and, the, and that investigation is underway now. A couple more points on Order 1000 and siting. Order 1000, I think, has struck a good balance, as, as the chairman said, Chairman Wellinghoff, between regional deference and the federal needs. He listened to us. We all submitted a lot of comments, and I think the FERC listened. Yes, on some issues like cost, allocate, cost allocation, I would argue that FERC punted. For punted some of the issues down the road. There's nothing wrong with that. We live in a federalist system. So these cost allocation systems are going to be critical. One is in our region. Our region is, is participant funding, bilateral deals. We're not in an RTO region. So participant funding is mentioned in Order 1000 as a possible way of funding transmission, but you cannot use it for a regional cost allocation mechanism. It has to be different than participant funding. But in my view, the order is a little bit fuzzy on the difference between participant funding by the transmission provider and, uh, and whatever the new interregional cost allocation system is going to be, let's say, between PJM and MISO. This is all to be worked out. Uh, the siting issues, just let me say a word on that. The states obviously felt very strongly about that. 
Uh, as many of you know, we weighed in quite strongly in, uh, how, how should I put this, in opposition to the chairman's proposal to, uh, on, on delegation of authority under Section 260. Um, we think there are a number of reasons for doing that. I think it's kind of in the past now, but we are grateful for that decision. But I can assure you on behalf of NARUC and member states in the West that we look forward to working with both the chairman and uh, uh, Lauren Azar on trying to get some of this stuff cited. The big issue in the West is federal agencies. As Congressman Walden said, whether it's BLM or the Forest Service, transmission projects in the West are being held up by federal citing delays. So, Mr. Chairman, yeah. with those remarks. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. DeStacio, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the uh, subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to address you today. My name is John DeStacio. I'm the General Manager and Chief Executive Officer of the Sacramento Municipal Util Utility District, or SMUD, as we're called. SMUD has been powering California's capital region for 65 years. Um, we have a population of 1.4 million customers, and I'm testifying on behalf of also the Large Public Power Council. The Large Public Power Council is an association of the nation's 25 largest municipal and state-owned utilities. LPPC members own approximately 35,000 miles of transmission lines in the U.S. We're not-for-profit systems, and we're directly accountable to consumers. We are pleased to serve consumers in seven states represented on the subcommittee. I speak from the perspective of a utility that is among the most aggressive in the nation in integrating renewable resources into its portfolio and in implementing demand-side management programs. Currently, 24 percent of SMUD's electric supply uh, portfolio is renewable, and we plan for that figure to increase to 37 percent by 2020, in exceeding state mandates. FERC Order 1000 was designed to encourage greater regional transmission planning and the more efficient construction of new transmission facilities. The planning features of the order and the funding mechanism for the development of new transmission facilities that FERC directs utilities to develop in the planning process have been championed by developers of renewable resources that are located far from customers and require the development of long-line transmission facilities in order to be commercially viable. I'm concerned that burdening ongoing planning discussion with debates over allocation of costs will undermine existing planning processes that are actually working fairly well. I'm also concerned that the cost allocation mechanism that Order 1000 contemplates will provide a subsidy for remotely located renewable generation. Speaking for a utility that has invested heavily in local renewable and demand management resources, this subsidy calls for a form of double payment for renewable resources that my customers have already funded. Looking ahead, I'm concerned that this subsidy will severely curtail the development of local renewable resources. I want to note that SMUD and other LPPC members have been active participants in existing regional planning processes. The requirement in Order 1000 that system planners now develop transmission cost allocation mechanisms based on a determination of so-called benefits calls for system planners to make highly subjective judgments. The Commission fails to articulate a definition of such benefits, and I am concerned that controversy over the identification and associated allocation of costs will throw a wrench into planning processes that are now functioning effectively. As to cost allocation, Order 1000 requires that each region of the nation develop a transmission plan that includes a cost allocation methodology meeting the Commission's specified criteria. Although the order provides the planning region some flexibility in deciding how to allocate costs of new facilities, it clearly prevents planning regions from relying on participant funding. This term describes current practice, which calls for entities that take service over new transmission lines to pay for them. We are further troubled by language in Order 1000 suggesting that costs may be allocated to entities even where no service relationship exists. This is a significant departure from historical FERC practice, which has always required an entity to agree to take service under a contract or tariff before charges could be assessed. FERC's proposal seems to me a little bit like a restaurant, which charges its customers for a list of items on its menu, whether the customers choose to order them or not. In filed comments, we have expressed our belief that the Commission lacks legal authority to allow developers to recover costs in this manner. 
We believe that allocating transmission costs broadly based on claimed benefits will subsidize transmission used to access remote resources. This may result in long, expensive transmission facilities being constructed to access remote resources even where there are no customers with a need to take service over them. We are concerned that this will result in the construction of unnecessary or underutilized facilities, the cost of which would be borne by consumers. SMUD owns and operates 102 megawatts of wind facilities with plans to more than double that capacity next year. We also operate one of the nation's largest utility-sponsored solar programs that is going to be approaching 100 megawatts in the next couple of years. These local generation investments have required only interconnection to local transmission. No new transmission lines have been needed to date. We believe that relying on these resources is a more efficient and least expensive way to meet the renewable policy established by our board and our state. These efficiencies will be lost if we are required under Order 1000 to pay for transmission we do not use. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And Mr. Transeth, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rush, and fellow committee members. Uh, it is an honor to appear before you today to talk about this very important issue that uh, faces our country today. Uh, my name is Stephen Transeth. I am a uh, principal partner of the law firm of Transeth & Associates, which provides uh, legal services and consulting services on energy issues. I'm a former member of the Michigan Public Service Commission, and I have had over 25 years dealing with uh, energy issues. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Coalition of Fair Trade Policy, which is a group of geographically and structurally diverse investor-owned utilities that have joined together for the purpose of promoting legislative and regulatory policies that will lead to a customer-focused development of the nation's electric transmission system in support of the growing demand for clean uh, generation resources. I would like to also stress that the coalition is supportive, as been stated uh, many times today, in upgrading the grid and in improving the grid to make sure that it meets our growing needs as we go forward. However, the co coalition does have certain concerns on some of the progress that's been made, especially in what has been done under Order 1000. The coalition believes that the cost of transmission must be allocated proportional to the measurable benefits that the customer receives, and an accurate cost allocation process is critical to ensure that the right price signals are sent and that the consumers are receiving clean energy at the lowest possible rates. Uh, the coalition believes that there are many uh, uh, deficiencies within the order, but I, today I just want to talk really about three. The first is we do believe that too much delegation has been made to non-governmental regional entities to determine transmission planning and cost allocation. We must understand that these regional, trans, uh, regional entities aren't necessarily uh, con uh, continuous uh, uh, groups of entities that have a commonality of interest, but many times have diverse types of interest and needs. And consequently, you have regions such as RTOs, which was mentioned earlier, which may or may not necessarily be meeting the needs of each of its individual members vis-a-vis -vis what we're talking about in terms of uh, transmission today. And in fact, many of these regions, such as RTOs, have a contractual duty to the transmission operators and generators and do not have the legal responsibility or accountability to the customers to make sure that the rates that are imposed upon them are just and reasonable. Two. FERC has failed to provide limitations and parameters on what is going to be defined as a benefit and who are the beneficiaries. By allowing benefits to be de uh, defined very broadly and costs to be spread very widely, it is going to be impossible to ensure that those two are commensurate. And consequently, you're going to have incidences, and I will speak to Michigan's situation in a minute, where customers are going to be forced to pay for benefits they do not receive. Finally, we believe that the uh, Order 1000 does not go far enough in ensuring that states and localities do have a say in how these decisions are made. Uh, Michigan is another example where we are put into a situation where the RTO has made certain policy decisions in terms of how they're going to progress in terms of their transmission planning that we believe is detrimental to, to our state. Uh, by failing to require this bottom-up planning process, FERC has effectively eliminated consumers from the decision-making process. These concerns are not speculative, but are currently being played out in the 13 states that make up the Midwest RTO. FERC last December approved a cost allocation system 
method that provides for new transmission called multi-valued projects, or MVPs, and then allowed for the socialization of those costs across all members of the RTO. The multi-value within that these programs is the additional benefit factor of meeting public policy requirements. But whose public policies are going to be advocated? Michigan uh, recently, in, in, in fact four years ago, passed legislation to embark on a very aggressive program to make uh, renewable energy as a um, driving mechanism of revitalizing our economy. It, uh, Mr. Welsh is going to, in the near future, going to be breaking ground on 500,000 megawatts out, coming out of our thumb to bring wind onto the market. Uh, Consumers Energy has built new wind uh, farms in the Ludington area, and we're looking at putting offshore wind to our Great Lakes. You contrast that to what is occurring in some of the plain states of Minnesota, Iowa, and the South Dakota, where they have adopted what seems to be the, the uh, public policy that's going to be uh, pursued by the RTO uh, called MISO. Uh, that is building large wind farms and, and transporting those, exporting those, that wind across uh, long distance transmission to the, to the east. Those are both valuable and have merit in their own pursuit. But when you have a policy in place that promotes one to the expense of the other, you're going to have trouble. If the MISO tariff is allowed to stand as, as it is, it will eliminate Michigan's ability to pursue public policy as, is determined for, as it has determined is best for its customers. And most importantly, we will end up paying for benefits that will be, we'll end up paying for uh, the cost of the transmission and receive little or no benefits in, in return. Michigan is not alone in this. We just happen to be first out of the barrel on this. This is something that could happen across the board as these RTOs uh, uh, develop their policy. We are not alone in our concerns, and the evidence is more than evident by the fact that over 60 petitions have been filed for, uh, requesting a rehearing on Order 1000. We believe that it is entirely appropriate and timely for Congress to conduct this hearing and consider the broad implications of 1000. Once again, I thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the committee. My name is Nick Brown. I'm President Chief Executive Officer of Southwest Power Pool, whose mission is helping our members work together to keep the lights on today and in the future. I want to emphasize helping our members work together. We don't do it for them. We don't do it to them. We help them work together to resolve these issues. We are a FERC-recognized regional transmission organization, and in fulfilling our mission, we administer an open access transmission service tariff, and we do serve as the planning authority for our members who serve customers in all or parts of the states of New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. 370,000 square mile service territory, over 57,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines interconnecting over 850 generating units. We appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today about Order 1000. It has been our experience in fulfilling our strategic plan over the last several years of building a more robust transmission network, that the single largest impediment to building a robust transmission network is how to allocate costs for needed transmission expansion in a fair and equitable way. And we have met that challenge in multiple ways. Last year, we received approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on a completely new integrated transmission planning process that looks at our needs on an iterative basis, focused on a 20-year period, then a 10-year period, then a near-term period. And we've coupled that transmission planning process with cost allocation methodologies that do, in fact, pair uh, the cost with the beneficiaries through a new highway byway cost allocation methodology where the extra high voltage facilities, uh, the cost for which are shared very broadly across the entire footprint because our studies have shown and our states have agreed that everyone benefits from that extra high voltage transmission. 
The lower voltage facilities are paid for more on a local basis. It is important to note when we are, were approved as a regional transmission organization in 2004 that SPP delegated to our regional state committee the responsibility for determining the methodology to allocate cost for new transmission. The regional state committee consists of a commissioner from each of the states in which our members serve. We brought them together. We determined how to calculate benefits for new transmission. Once that methodology for calculating benefit was determined, we ran studies and the, the cost allocation methodology that we have in place that was approved by the FERC last year uh, is a result of all of that very collaborative approach. Our experience, again, is that the single toughest issue is dealing with cost allocation. And our view of Order 1000 uh, is that the Commission got it right with the requirement for regional planning. It is just not sufficient to build the type of transmission infrastructure that our country needs on looking at an individual company basis. So the requirement for regional planning uh, was right on the mark. We also strongly support uh, Order 1000's requirement that links cost allocation with transmission planning. It is a necessary step to move forward. We also strongly support Order 1000's requirement to construct transmission considering federal and state public policy needs. And we appreciate uh, the flexibility that Order 1000 gave regional planning authorities to consider the diverse needs uh, of those public policy requirements within each region. We also strongly support Order 1000's requirement for interregional coordination and cost allocation. And while many believe the Commission went too far, uh, our region believes the Commission could have gone further uh, to allow uh, little guidance on how to allocate cost for transmission facilities that have interregional impacts uh, will just cause more delay and more confusion. Uh, we had to tackle that within our own region and to expect that it can be voluntarily tackled on an interregional basis, uh, I believe will take a much more significant time than the 18 months in which we were given. Uh, the stakeholders within each region are diverse, the stakeholders uh, and the regions are diverse. It, it will simply take longer than 18 months to uh, work through a collaborative process to reach consensus on those issues. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Members Rush and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear here today. My name is uh, Joseph Welch, and I'm the CEO, President of ITC Holdings, Inc. Do you have your microphone on? I do. Okay. Do I need to get it closer here? All right. There were people in the audience quite upset that they didn't hear what you were saying. Well, I, I'm glad that that's to hear that. I'm <laughs> <laughs> ITC, which is headquartered in Novi, Michigan, is the largest independent transmission company in the United States. ITC owns, operates, and maintains transmission assets in Michigan, portions of Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas, spanning both the MISO and SPP RTOs. Unlike most utilities, ITC is independent, meaning we are not a market participant. We do not generate, buy, or sell power. We move electricity across our wires under a federal tariff at a regulated rate. It is no secret that our transmission grid is outdated and never has been designed to be a regional serving grid. Today, 70 percent of the transmission lines are 25 years old or older, 70 percent of our large power transformers are 25 years or older, and 60 percent of our circuit breakers are more than 30 years old, and the interconnection between utilities are generally weak. Per capita consumption of energy has doubled in the same time period, and our population has grown by 50 percent. To add to the stress, the aging infrastructure, energy demand is expected to increase by 25 percent by the year 2030. A quick history of the ramifications of underinvestment in transmission. In 2003, at a cost of nearly $10 billion, the power went out 
for nearly 50 million people in the Midwest, the East Coast, and Canada, and highlighted the frailty of the interconnected grid. More recently, we have seen the effects of an outdated and stressed transmission system where Southern California, Arizona, and Texas have experienced blackouts. Not one of these instances was caused by lack of generation. The Department of Energy estimates that the major power outages and power quality disturbance cost of the economy between $25 and $150 billion annually. In addition to blackouts, lack of investment leads to inefficient markets, energy curtailments, higher congestion, and pockets of generation market power, all of which lead to higher energy prices. In response to the 2003 blackout, this committee worked to pass the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and included provisions to help facilitate the investment in new transmission. FERC has been working with the regions to address the challenges that planning and cost allocation present to transmission expansion. Order 1000 is not perfect, but it is an important incremental step forward. Regional planning has been going on for decades to some degree. It's not a new concept. The problem with regional planning is the participation of regional transmission organizations is voluntary. Not surprising, that leaves these organizations hostage to competitive interests of market participants. If an RTO is considering a decision that will impact a market participant's above market generation, they threaten to leave that RTO. The RTO then develops a suboptimal regional plan to retain the members. Order 1000 incrementally improves the regional planning process by requiring stakeholders to determine in advance what criteria the RTO will be using in the planning and requires RTOs to establish a process for interregional projects which do not exist today. Order 1000 also addressed the issue of paying for transmission projects that provide for regional benefits. The Commission allows the regions to make proposals following six governing principles designed to protect consumers. FERC has an obligation to ensure that rates are just and reasonable, that they do not have anti-competitive effects. Rhetoric that FERC is mandating certain methodologies or forcing customers to do, who do not benefit to bear costs is blatantly inaccurate and clearly intended to mislead this committee. In fact, Order 1000 specifically states, and I quote, costs may not be involuntary allocated to entities that do not receive benefits, end of quote, and must be roughly commensurate with the estimated benefits received from a project. More plainly put, if you do not benefit, you do not pay. I understand that those who are opposed to the regional transmission are seeking legislative rate making through S-400 or other legislations, but I encourage that this com committee consider their motives. They want Congress to undermine the agreements the regions, which are comprised of voluntary members, have spent years developing in federal government to impose transmission costs on small groups of users to make transmission costs prohibitive retain captive markets and eliminate competitors. These results do not benefit customers. I would note that a number of utilities who compromise the transit coalition have some of the highest average retail rates in their region and they are here today opposing FERC's efforts to encourage transmission development and more robust competitive wholesale markets. I would suggest to this committee that this is more than a coincidence. Let me also take a note to dismiss the notion that the transmission drives up electric bills. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, transmission costs account for only 7% of an average residential customer's bill, while generation accounts for nearly 68% in Michigan. And in Michigan, the transmission portion of the bill is lower than the national average and is only between 4 and 5%. Let me say again, in Michigan, where over eight years of ITC has invested $1.2 billion in the transmission system, we remain below the national average in terms of percentages of delivered energy costs to retail customers. Basically, this is because Michigan is one of the highest electric rates in the region. This may lead you to ask if ITC has made such a significant investment in transmission in Michigan, how can we have the highest wholesale rates in MISO if, in fact, Transmission lowers the cost of energy to customers. I want to close with this because the answer highlights the value of independence and explains why rational, independent regional transmission planning and cost allocation me mechanisms that allow these projects to be identified to be built are so vital. First, the $1.2 billion was needed to just bring the system to reasonable standards. Next, the state sits on a seam 
between PJM and MISO, and there is no cross-border planning to identify the projects that would provide for the access of the most competitive generation in either RTO. And finally, the actual transmission projects that would be built to bring more competitive generation into the state lie outside the state of Michigan. The utility that we need to build the transmission to benefit Michigan will not if they do not see value for their customers that they have to charge. This is a perfect example of the problem the FERC Order 1000 addresses. My time has expired, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, how many, I, I'm going to follow Mr. Dingle's admonition of trying to answer yes or no for the first question. How many of you believe that the cost allocation uh, uh, policy in order number 1000 is necessary to build new transmission lines in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Mr. White. I do. I'm going to say no. 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 Absolutely, yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we have a four no's and two yeses. Okay. Now, one of you, it may have been you, Mr. Transith, or maybe it was Mr. Destachio, stated that you do not believe that the Commission has the legal authority to permit transmission developers to recover costs from entities with which they do not have a contract or a service relationship. Uh, is, is, was that you, Mr. Destachio, or It was me, and, and um, while I'm not an attorney, our attorneys have, have advised in looking at this that it is, a, it is a pretty big departure from past precedent of how FERC has looked at this, as well as the aforementioned case around cost causation. Um, this really does create at least the opportunity for costs to be um, allocated to people that don't have a service need or relationship or a contract or a tariff. So you are obviously very much concerned about that. Yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Welsh, you, you are a uh, transmission developer. Do you think that they do not have the legal authority to permit that? or? I'm assuming you do. You have the legal authority to permit that. And your two lawyers have talked to each other about it, I guess, right? <laughs> I try not to talk to lawyers. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I guess it was Mr. Transith. You said that the Commission's failure to limit, in, you know, I asked the question to the, uh, Mr. Wallinghoff about the lack of clarity on determining what is the benefit in calculating benefit and developing these cost allocations. And um, you, you say in your testimony that the Commission's failure to limit in any way what individual regions may consider as benefits is a fatal flaw of the rule, and also that regions under the rule would presumably be allowed to assert that certain types or classes of projects have certain environmental or social benefits and that that might be uh, used and uh, therefore really socializing the cost. Do any of the other members uh, have the same concerns that Ms. Mr. Transith has on that issue? I, okay. I do not, and primarily because of the governance structure within our organization. We are driven by our members. The members and the regional state committee are the stakeholders who are making the decisions on how to calculate the benefits. Some benefits are extremely easy to quantify. Other benefits are much more soft. But either way, the stakeholders are working mm -hmm. together to identify those benefits, and that can occur mm -hmm. in every region in the country. Mr. Destachio? Yeah, the, the, um, I, I agree with Mr. Transith on that issue from the standpoint that once we commit to uh, a regional planning process, we may not know what the calculation of benefits will be until we're already committed to cost allocation that could come out from right. the stakeholders that we would, we would be on the losing end of that argument and ultimately get imposed costs that we otherwise would have not signed up for. Mm -hmm. So it's because we don't know the benefits up front they may be very difficult to calculate. And if they get to FERC with all good intentions, uh, it, it could end up being for benefits that we wouldn't agree 
um, exist. Well, I mean, it seems to me that this uh, Order 1000 certainly lends itself to considering so-called benefits that have never been considered before in order to uh, pursue a social objective or an environmental objective or whatever. Would you, Mr. Uh, Welch. Let me, let me state, too, that um, I agree with uh, Mr. Brown that um, Order 1000 uh, really gave the flexibility to the regions, and I want to emphasize this one more time, which are voluntary organizations where people have got to come together and they sit at a table and in the process in MISO, I will talk about, which Michigan is a member of, the process took in excess of two years for them to come to an agreement of any sort of how to allocate costs. Once you start talking about allocating costs, and no one ever wants to pay the bill, but when you can get general agreement, that's as good as it's going to get. And I believe that Order 1000 absolutely sent this, the message to the, to the regions to come together and do this on your mm -hmm. own and gave them the flexibility of what to consider or what mm -hmm. not to consider. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, it, it just seems to me that this certainly expands the Federal Power Act of just and reasonable and can go much further than was anticipated at one time. So that's one of the issues we're trying to uh, deal with here. And, uh, but, but, the fact, but can I just add to this? But the fact still remains, whether they consider that or not, there still has to be a benefit to cost ratio that exists before you can charge for it. So the fact that you consider the renewable resource or you can ex ex further expand that to think about integrating it into the grid, that's one issue. But the second issue is how the cost allocation is allocated. And that cost allocation cannot be allocated unless there are benefits commensurate with the cost. Mm -hmm. and we can sit here and argue about that, mm -hmm. but the fact is, is it's got to be clear that the benefits line up with the cost. Well, you know, that's what the hearing is all about because uh, the FERC has issued this order and uh, maybe Congress may decide that it needs to do some legislation because maybe we don't view it the same way that FERC does. But that's why we have the hearings. But Mr. Rush, you're recognized for five minutes. And there's Mr. Dingham. Okay, you're right now. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my questions, uh, questions uh, is directed to Mr. both Mr. White and Mr. Jones. Uh, and the comments uh, made to my office by uh, the uh, Illinois Commerce Commission, uh, the commission noted that first, did not define the role of state regulators and did not provide a means for states to fully participate in transmission planning as stipulated in Order 890. Uh, the question to both of you uh, uh, is, uh, are you satisfied that state regulators will be able to participate in a meaningful way in the planning process as outlined in, in Order 1000, or do you share the belief that FERC made a mistake in not prescribing a more substantive role for the states? Thank you, Mr. Rush. Um, I, I, do, I do believe that the states uh, and state commissions will have a substantive role in the planning process. Um, however, uh, in my view, more of the decision-making authority has been given to the RTOs, to the regional uh, process uh, that, that you know, should have been better defined, should have more clearly uh, deferred to the state's authority. Um, at, at the end of the day, we're the ones who have to ensure that the bills that our customers receive uh, are just and reasonable and, and demonstrate the benefits. And I think that without that uh, better clarification in the order, uh, that's not evident. But I do believe that we will be uh, actively and substantially involved in the planning process. Mr. Rush, I think the, uh, uh, the tension here is a delicate balance between being very prescriptive in giving flexibility. 
I think Chairman Wallinghoff uh, really struck it right. I think there is a lot of flexibility to regional organizations in the Midwest, the West, and elsewhere, and it's not that prescriptive. As I described in my testimony, I can just speak for the West. We've been doing this, as I said, for three decades, voluntarily. And so we're used to it. The transmission providers do consult with us. Uh, we have these sub-regional groups that have filed open access transmission tariffs with FERC. FERC has approved them. State commissions are involved in the planning processes for NTGG and Columbia Grid, these sub-regional groups. The only uh, area where I would ask the subcommittee to be uh, mindful of is DOE, through taxpayer dollars, has funded this very ambitious interconnection-wide planning effort. And the, the schedules are, are, are set to be done by the end of 2013. Um, taxpayer dollars are being spent. We commissioners are flying all over the country. I can tell you, ISPIC, the Western Interconnect, Texas, and ERCOT, we're spending a lot of time in planning processes now that take into account renewables, energy efficiency, nuclear, coal, you know, the whole, the whole gamut of possible generation technologies, and then integrating those into the modern grid. So the question I would urge the subcommittee to be mindful of is how do those processes fit into Order 1000 and the compliance filings? Right now the timelines are 12 months and 18 months, as you know. So 12 months, uh, the transmission providers have to file with FERC on the regional plans. 18 months, they have to file on the interregional cost allocation schemes. That is before they finish all these before all these plans are rolled up interconnection-wide in ISPEC and in the West in ERCOT. So I would just hope that we're being consistent here. We state commissioners are being spending a lot of time, effort, and resources going to all these meetings, and I just hope the federal government agencies, DOE and FERC, as you saw on the first panel, really coordinate on this. In my uh, discussions with uh, Chairman uh, Wallenhoff, uh, he indicated that uh, he wanted to stress competition in the market in order to ultimately help reduce costs to customers. Uh, and this is a question for the panel. Does anyone want to comment on this uh, and, and either agree or dispute the idea that the approach outlined by FERC would indeed increase competition and tap down uh, Consumer calls. Anybody I, want to? I truly believe that it's going to spur competition, as I said in my prepared remarks. Number one, we don't have a grid that was designed to be truly interregional. Number two, we can't get the, the low cost power, especially from Michigan, into Michigan because the transmission developments are outside, or outside, lie outside the state, the things that we need to do to get that import capability. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussions here about, you know, whether we're going to integrate renewables and how that all figures out. But just imagine that, and we'll change the discussion now to a different market. Let's talk about something like grain. And while you read in the paper that there's this bumper crop of, in Argentina of wheat, and all of a sudden you look at the commodities future in the United States and the price of wheat drops. And why is that? Because there's a slow cost supply coming into the marketplace and it's displacing other, other entities. And so when these other states start to develop these renewables, they are mandated in those states to come in. But it has the effect of displacing their low-cost low generation that was otherwise used to serve their customers and makes it available to the marketplace to be bought. Michigan, being a high-cost producer, is the, is the first state to benefit from such a marketplace if we can get the transmission built. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shimkus, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and I, I really appreciate the panel. This is uh, for, uh, for electricity geeks like you all are, and some of us have become. This is uh, something we've talked about for a long time, going back to the, uh, the bills and, you know, the electricity generation and the public utility commissions were, in essence, controlled within state lines, and we did intend on the 2005 energy bill to help expedite siding and transmission to start having a more vibrant market. Now we've evolved in this green movement, which I would argue would bring high cost electricity in. And now we have the debate on how are we going to pay for that 
and who's going to bear the cost when we, as a public policy-wise, push green and solar, which is high-cost electricity. And I've said this numerous times, it's credible. I'm not making this stuff up. It just costs more. So now, who's going to pay for that? And then how do we define benefits? And who's going to define the benefits? I would, if you stayed with the simplistic financial decision, low-cost power, without government bureaucrats and politicians intervening and deciding what's good for the world, um, then you could do a basic market analysis and, and price calculation and, and drive for lower cost. But when we get involved and say, we've got to go solar, we've got to go wind, we, we start taking some cheap coal power offline, uh, we are intervening. So I guess my... So I think, so the point is, if we, if the definition of benefits is vague, how do we really move forward? Anyone want to take a sh well, shot at that? I'll go first, but I see Nick wanted to grab the microphone <laughs> since he's on the side that has to develop them. I don't think that the benefits are vague. They are cost benefits, plain, pure, and simple, in the end. Those are those items that... It, you can't do a cost-benefit analysis without two, with everything being quantified as a dollar bill. And in the end, it's, it's simply money. The question becomes... But public policy at the state level intervenes but, with but renewable public, power that's more expensive and a mandate of, of a but, 10, 15, or 20 percent renewable power p position. Who, who am I, and, and candidly, who are you to tell each state what they want to have for their own? Who am I to determine on the transmission grid if well, we have to intervene, you can't define benefits, but, and then you pass it on to states no, who don't but, want that? No, but the, at the state level, these people are passing laws in their state that they're going to have renewable portfolio standards. My job isn't to dictate whether that is a rational law or, or an irrational law. My job is to facilitate the marketplace in a way that makes it cost effective. And when they put those facilities in, online, those people in that state have made the decision they want that. The and those is, people in those states should be able to bear the higher utility cost and understand and, and they, from whence it comes. And they are paying for that renewable energy. They are paying for that renewable energy. That is not being passed on to some amorphous other people. But if you're in a regional transmission organization and you're expanding the transmission grid, and I think part of this debate is, I mean, really, this is about cost allocation or participant funding. This, though, is about the cost allocation of the transmission. All right, all right. Let me have, I got some, you disagree. I have some nods that might agree with my position, uh, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Mr. I need some help here. Mr. Shimkus, I'll... Can we in the Calvary? I'll give you... I'm, I'm a state regulator, and I'm here to help you, so... <laughs> oh, um, yeah. That's like the government. <laughs> uh, let the transmission... Just, just let me make uh, th three points. Let the transmission planners do their work. These guys are good, the engineers. We have all these sub... Sub-regional plans, SPP's doing work. We're doing work in the West. The, these are good guys. The, they know how to quantify the, the cost-benefit analysis, the, what we call CBA, but incorporate all these new things that are a little more difficult to quantify, but they can do it. So that's number one. Number two, a state like mine is an integrate, we do 20-year plans called integrated resource plans, and those require lease cost. So I'm here to make sure that both transmission and generation is provided to my ratepayers at lease cost. We update those plans every two years. I can tell you that for my utility, Puget Sound Energy, the first 300 megawatt wind plant that they put in our state was least cost. And you was also have huge hydroelectric, which is very helpful. Let me go to Mr. Okay. White real quick, just, uh, I mean, just making sure that for full disclosure. Mr. White? Yes, Mr. Shimkus, thank you very much. Um, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think the definition of benefits is critical here. The devil is in the details. There are assumptions used. Uh, by certain parties as to what constitutes a benefit, and that may not be shared or may not be accurate across the system. To Mr. Rush's question, there's no question in my mind that, that uh, strategically developing transmission uh, will facilitate markets and can deliver tremendous uh, benefits to, to uh, customers at the state, local, regional level. Uh, at the same time, if we're, if we're simply focusing on transmission as the answer to all, 
we're precluding a lot of other more strategic local options that could in fact be significantly less costly because yeah. they can connect directly to the distribution system, thereby bypassing the need for very, very expensive long haul transmission systems. And so my point is it, the devil's in the details and, and I think you're exactly right. The benefits is critical here. I want to his, thank the his, chairman. His time's expired, yeah. but I'm going to let you oh, uh, good. Too, re respond uh, if you do this. I, I just wanted to respond with an example. First of all, um, if you look at my state and the states of many of the LPPC members, California has a renewable energy standard that envisions it will be developed in state. And our governor just added another 12,000 megawatt requirement for uh, distributed generation. So when we look at our resource planning, which we do bottom up, by the way, to get to least cost, we don't see a need to have um, long line transmission paid for by our consumers because it really is in conflict with state policy. <laughs> that said, we have certain occasions right now we're connected to the Pacific Northwest in Northern California more so than Southern California. And so we have a, a line that was built to access hydro from the Northwest and for us to transmit power when it's cold in the winter there and they transmit down to us when it's hot in the summer in California. But we did it on participant funding, and we actually have people that operate on that line with different market models. So there's examples of this occurring, especially in the West, where we effectively don't need additional cost allocation mechanisms to make these kind of investments work. Mr. Shimkus, we do share that low-cost, cheap hydro with our friends in California. Just to answer the question about this whole concept of benefits and the lack of uh, definition. I think it goes even farther than that. It's just not the benefits. It's who the beneficiaries are that need to be also included in this process. A good example, like I said in my t uh, testimony, we, it isn't this is a lot of speculative. We, got, we have a case study going on right now with the MISO, that's the Midwest RTO, and what's going on uh, in our, how does Indiana, who does not have an RPS, it doesn't need the, the, the value of renewables that are going to come out of these uh, MVP projects, but yet they're going to be forced, because they're part of the region, to pay for the cost commensurate to whatever it is that their load is uh, for, for that new energy. If you don't connect those two, benefits and beneficiaries, you can never have a commensurate uh, measure. You have to make both decide, is this a defined benefit that we can measure, and plus, is those who are going to actually receive the benefit receiving it commensurate to what cost you're imposing upon them? Great panel, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, Mr. Engel, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to uh, direct a, a few questions to Mr. Transeth, um, because um, you, I understand you're testifying testifying on behalf of the Coalition for Fair yes. Transmission Policy, and it includes Con Edison of, of New York yes. uh, as, as a member. Um, I represent um, a lot of New York City and Westchester County, and I want to make sure uh, that we understand your concerns. Um, firstly, do you agree with uh, Chairman Willinghoff and, and NERC that we'll need significant expansion of our power lines by 2019? I'm going to go back to one of the comments I made during uh, my original testimony, and that is this is not about an obvious need, as Mr. Welsh talked about, in terms of improving and upgrading the system and making sure that we are going to be able to meet our energy needs as we go forward. The question involved in this whole debate is, you know, where are we going to build this transmission? How much are we going to build and who's going to pay for it? And that last one is really the key that we're going to keep stumbling upon. As we've got to make decisions, and that's going to my comments just a few minutes ago, is deciding what are the benefits, who are the beneficiaries, and somehow or another coming up with some meaningful and supportable proposition of how those are roughly commensurate, as the Seventh Circuit put forth in their case. Well, let me give you a chance to, to expand and, and talk about cost uh, allocation, because that's what everyone is, is, is concerned about here. Um, I understand the current law, uh, once a um, transmission line is approved, I understand that the grid operators have fairly a broad um, discretion in determining who ought to pay for the line. Um, it could be all regional customers, am I correct, or it could be a, a, a subset of consumers directly benefiting from the line. Am I correct about that? 
Uh, maybe one of the RTOs can speak. It depends on the region and the provisions in each regional tariff. Okay. I guess the answer, I assume that if MISO, which is what we're asking, we would like them to designate Michigan as a separate subregion. I, I, I see no reason why they couldn't amend their tariff and do that, and that's what we're, that's what we're seeking and looking for. Uh, so yes, I guess the answer to that is if they determine that, in fact, Michigan is not receiving uh, the sufficient benefits to warrant 20 percent of the cost of these MPV projects that they could designate us as a separate subregion. Uh, let me get you, uh, give you a chance to um, um, add on to some of what you've said. That's always um, dangerous. In, in, in your only on our side it is. <laughs> um, in your opinion, does uh, order of thousands, uh, order of thousands cost uh, allocation make transmission cost determinations more or less fair than the current system? I, the potential is, uh, is, as I've said many times about Order 1000, it's not so much what it says, it's what it doesn't say. I, I think that uh, the basis is there. It's all going to kind of come out on how this is finally determined. It, at some point or another, some decisions are going to have to be made, both a, a rehearing or as they go through the compliance filings. Uh, that is going to somehow or another going to wash out, and we're going to know more about where they're coming. And I guess it's coming from the chairman's question that I f disagree with Chairman Willinghoff's statement. I think that there is a problem with clarity with this order, and that's what we have to get to the point. We need to and start inserting some clarity into Order 1000 if we're going to get to the point that you're asking. Yeah, am, am I right in, in saying that Order 1000's, call, according to my interpretation of it, the costs um, need to be allocated at least roughly commensurate with the estimated benefits, and those who don't receive Benefits should not be allocated cost, and, and no cost should be allocated to, uh, to another region unless that other region agrees to it? That is the principles in which they establish in Order 1000. I don't know if, as you read the 620 pages, that that necessarily comes out in the wash in the, the process. But that is a principle that they stated. And by the way, much of that language comes directly out of the Seventh Circuit case. So I assume that that was one of the factors in which why they... Uh, uh, or uh, you issued some of the language they did in Order 1000. Um, in your testimony, uh, you testified that Order 1000 does not define the term benefits. Mr. White uh, recently mentioned the benefits. What definition of benefits do you think is appropriate? Well, <laughs> the $64,000 question, I guess. Well, I, that is going to be, uh, and I suppose uh, if I knew the exact answer that I should be uh, sitting on FERC, but I, I think at the very minimum, we have to make sure that whatever benefits that we're looking at, that they are going to be somewhat measurable. We've got to be able to say this is a benefit, and somehow or another this is going to have some measurable impact on certain parties, and that gets to the second part that I've talked about where you need to also be able to be able to find who the beneficiaries are. Let me ask you a final question under the wire with the, with, with the chairman's uh, uh, benevolence. I'm sure um, let me will, will order 1,000, in your opinion, uh, result in New York City residents having to pay more for their electricity? And if so, why? I, uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on, on that. No hunch? No? In and of itself, Order 1000 is not, would not do that. It's how that gets implemented is whether that happens or not. If, if it goes the way that we're afraid, it's probably going to raise your cost. If, on the other hand, some of our concerns are addressed and there's some clarity brought into the process, no. Then I think we get into some of the situations that Mr. Welsh was talking about in terms of actually making some kind of meaningful impact with transmission and, and, and competitive markets. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pompeo, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, anybody on the panel, uh, by the way, Mr. Shimka said he's an electricity geek. That must make me an electricity geek in training. Um, so uh, does anybody on the panel think that Order 1000 favors or disfavors any type of power generation, either intentionally or in its effect? I would say no, with the exception that it has a heavy emphasis on public policy requirements, state by mm -hmm. state. And you, you know what's been going on in the states. It's no secret. 30 states have RPSs. Including so, Kansas? Pardon? Including Kansas. Including your state, yeah. Right, right. Uh, and so it, 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 you're saying then that it benefits or it's, it's designed to try and take account for and acknowledge those uh, public policies that those states have created? Correct. Right. 
Representative. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I guess how I would word it is one, uh, Order 1000 allows for the opportunity, which it did not before, for states to establish a public policy that say we want them renewables and so that it will be developed that way. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think things work pretty well in the Southwest Power Pool. I think we've actually done a, a pretty good job as I have now uh, had a chance to learn more about it. How many of these, we talk about these interregional planning, how many interregional lines would have been built in 2010 or 2011? Are these, these happen once a decade? Do we have one every couple hours? How, how, how many of these are we really talking about? Well, without uh, knowing how to alloc allocate the costs for those lines, uh, I would agree with Mr. Welch, none. Yeah. Uh, in our region, since uh, the Energy Policy Act of 1992, very, very little transmission has been built because no one really knew how to allocate the cost and who was benefiting from uh, the expansion of the transmission network. And so when we tackled the issue of cost allocation in our footprint, now all of a sudden we have notices to construct to our members that exceed $5 billion worth of transmission over the next 10 years. Uh, it clearly was an impediment in our region. I can't speak for the West. They seem to think they're building all the transmission they need. We were not. Uh, we are now. Uh, and in terms of understanding the benefit from an engineer's perspective, it's a very simple calculation of adjusted production cost savings. And all of our states are used to dealing with that particular type of calculation. Everyone has used it in regulatory proceedings for decades. And it's a very simple calculation. Uh, it's, it's worked in our region. Representative, I, I think that uh, the answer to that is we have long neglected our transmission system for too long. Yeah. And we are now on the verge of, I think, seeing a, a new I don't know if you want to call it a renaissance, but we're going to see a lot of transmission built in the, in the coming years. I think that the way we generate, transmit, and use energy is going to look completely different 10, 20 years from now. And all of that is going to come into play with some of the decisions that, like, we're making today. Great. I have, uh, I've heard some concerns, Mr. Welch, I'll direct this to you, that, um, that Order 1000 creates the risk of the overbuild of transmission lines that will create excess capacity, either as a national matter or in particular localities or regions. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, in my uh, pre-filed uh, testimony, I, I give uh, to the committee members a couple of maps. Um, one map shows the high voltage grid in the United States, and the other map shows the uh, interstate highway system in the United States. And another map shows the interstate gas pipelines in the United States. And, can, and can look at them and ask yourself, especially like in states like Kansas, uh, if you think that you're going to be have uh, a levelized electric access to competitive markets with totally the absence of a high voltage electric grid. It's, the map is stark by its own realities that there's none there. Uh, it's so much so that in Kansas, uh, when we first came there to do business, we were asked by the state legislature to come and help them out. Uh, because they were frustrated because at, at Nick's area, they were still wrestling to the ground this issue of cost allocation. And there were lines there that had such huge benefits to Kansas. They said, well, hell, we'll just pay for them ourselves. We've got to get somebody to build them. Uh, huge price disparities across the state of Kansas. In fact, if memory serves me right, six cents a kilowatt hour difference between the east side of the state and west side of the state. So if you're on the west side of the state, you're not too happy. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with that. And, and as a result of that, uh, we need to get that regional transmission built, and you have people there that uh, aren't large enough to enjoy the benefits of large power plants. And as you know, they're trying to build a large power plant there. Without that transmission system that lets it get to other small regional users in Oklahoma and other states, it won't exist, and again, you'll be captive to that. So look at the map and ask yourself if this is a, if, if those maps that you see there is the road, the, the map, that gives us the future of what, what's going to be a competitive energy market. It's stark. I, I don't think in my lifetime, uh, based on everything I've seen today, that I don't think in my lifetime we can overbuild a transmission grid. It's just virtually impossible by all of the, the things. Just to get through the cost allocation, we've been at this for about 10 years. Now we're going to try to address siding. We're worried about uh, giving a FERC 
uh, first, we don't want FERC to say anything, or we want them to say everything about the benefits, so we can pinpoint that. But we don't want them involved in siting. Yeah. And and so it, the, this is a system that just isn't set up for us to get to where we need to be. Great, thank you. We'd love to build that power plant in Western Kansas. If we, could get the, get if we get the EPA to let us to do it, we'd do it. My uh, it. my time has expired. You need it. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I just give the counter answer to that, I guess, to a certain extent, if, that, if I could have just a few minutes. And, yeah, and then Mr. Destaccio want to make a comment, so. Uh, I, I just want to say, I, I guess I think that there is the potential of overbuild with this, because you, you are removing a lot of the traditional economic factors that would go into decision making. You don't have a best practice sometimes in play if you are socializing cost over a broad uh, system. So I think that there is the potential. We would have to be very careful to make sure that that doesn't happen. But that would be one of the fears I would have that you have gold plated uh, transmission systems as opposed to uh, what might be that which is adequate in for the development. And I would just echo that in that if, if the need is not clearly identified and the benef benefits test isn't clearly articulated, you could end up with a circumstance where there, there's really not a need for transmission if you go through a typical resource planning process. Clearly, transmission is part of it, but some of the cities we represent, Sacramento, Orlando, um, Phoenix, um, we don't need additional resources, nor do we need additional transmission. The Western um, um, Energy Coordinating Council study that was talked about says there's no new transmission needed in the West until at least 2020, and then, frankly, they're doing a 20-year study that will look out beyond that. But we have no load growth in our system. We still are struggling with difficult economies. So if some of these lines were to get built uh, under other um, public purposes, um, we could end up with stranded investment that would actually compound the issues that are happening in our communities right now by adding cost to consumers for facilities they don't need. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bilbrey, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is interesting to hear some of the discussions from the different parts of the world. And uh, clarification, Mr. Jones, we do not, in San Diego, Southern California may get the hydro, but San Diego doesn't. <laughs> and I just want to make sure that Mr. Walsh understands that um, Southern California and San Diego were blacked out. We uh, no. never want to be mixed up with Los Angeles, OK? <laughs> In fact, our slogan is better North TJ than South LA. <laughs> but seriously, Mr. Jones, I'm going to get down um, into the grass here, if not right into the dirt on some of this stuff, because I think it's important. Um, I think we all, and this is one thing Democrats and Republicans should be able to agree on. Conservation, avoidance of cost, is the most efficient way of dress, you know, providing services as a base. And one of the things that Mr. Jones brought up that I, that I think we need to talk about now while we're talking about who's going to pay what and where is this, you know, the, the immense costs caused by obstruction of the federal government and siting alignments. Now, the um, uh, Sacramento area may be able to go to renewables because, let's face it, you go out in your suburbs, you've got old farmland, you've got areas you convert. You're not surrounded by, by gnat catcher habitat or least bells burial habitat. Um, you do not have to go over mountains to be able to get, get out of the area so you can legally site some of these facilities. Um, what about the fact that we don't seem to see real general planning or intricate planning on the siting of these alignments to start with? I'll give you an example. You can't go do a national forest. You can't go through an Indian reservation. To get out to our solar um, farms in the Imperial Valley, our lines have to be three times longer than the freeway that drives out there. Now, we're a country that says it's fine to run a freeway through an Indian reservation and a national forest, but not a power line going out to a clean energy source. Now. Mr. Jones, wouldn't you agree that maybe Democrats or Republicans ought to be talking about, frankly and openly, about what we need to do to change the system to, to make it easier and more cost effective to make those start citing those lines before we even start talking about building them? Yes, absolutely. And I think you need to direct these questions to Lauren Azar, to Ms. Azar. I think she's a uh, 
troubleshooter, and she's supposed to be heading up these rapid response teams dealing with these federal agency issues that, that uh, really impede the development of transmission in the West. But your other point on energy efficiency and demand side management is well taken, too. And I can assure you that the commissioners and the governor representatives were all looking at different scenarios in the West so that we may not have to build that $5 billion transmission line that connects San Diego with the Columbia River or, or with wind in Wyoming or wind in Alberta. We just, like, we just like to get out to our right. desert. So, so my oh, point... Oh, by the way, let me point yeah. out, we've been trying for 25 years with about eight different alignments to run the gauntlet through right. the federal government to get to um, be able to make that connection. But go ahead, Mr. Jones. My only point is that we do have uh, NGOs and stakeholders that participate in our processes who, who feel very strongly about these public values in our national it, land. So if we are going to build those transmission lines through these public sensitive areas, as a state regulator, my biggest concern is at their least cost. Okay, let me, let okay. me stop it right now and just say this. If you run the city and a county, a city has basically has a fiduciary response responsibility to site easements for water, gas, and electric. But when you get outside of the unincorporated areas, we have not required under the Johnson Act for local council of governments, counties, the regional governments to do the same type of, type of siting for transmission lines that every city does every municipality does in this country. And we've approached it that, well, that's the private sector or somebody else's problem. Is there any reasonable way that a reasonable, um, is there any reasonable uh, argument against the federal government finally saying under the Johnson Act, we require you to do this, 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 but we're also now going to require that you sit down and figure out where the appropriate easements are and start pre-citing these before be, um, and be a participant in it um, pre-planning like we do with zoning for um, right-of-ways for these alignments like we do other things. Go ahead, jump in. Can I answer that? Um, first of all, I want to <clears throat> comment because we've been somewhat critical uh, of Order 1000, but specific to siting, we've been very supportive of the efforts. In fact, several lines have been identified just under the same types of conditions that, that you're suggesting where corridors have been identified. We supported FERC getting backstop authority if the states couldn't act within a year for FERC to go ahead and assist with siting those lines. Um, I would but stop, stop. FERC is not, doesn't know the land use, doesn't know the easement, doesn't know endangered species, doesn't know the terrain. And the trouble is FERC comes in as an outsider when you already have local government, cities and counties serving as a body that could be making a decision on this they make it on everything else. They make it on military bases. They make it on all kinds of easements. Why is this different than what we would do with our roads? We do it with freeways. Why don't we do it with our power lines? Understood. I was just commenting on the fact that um, we're very supportive that something does need to get done about siting. Our issues have been re relatively narrow to cost allocation when it comes to Order 1000. And I would also like to say um, your comments about energy efficiency are very well taken. We have 15 percent energy efficiency. We're doing over 10 years, and we're doing that before we look at any other investments. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate that, and I just wanted to point out that if we built our freeway system the way we're trying to put our interlinks of not just, not just um, electricity, but also gas and water and a lot of other things, we would still be driving on two-lane roads right. around this country. We don't ask the private sector or the locals to, to decide and, and lay all these out. These are all pre-planned and done comprehensively regionally and statewide, and we need to be aggressive about that. And that's something Democrats and Republicans should be able to work on because it's our fault. We haven't taken leadership right. here. It's not theirs. I yield back. Well, you know, transmission cost allocation brings out the passion in all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Matsu, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to ask questions on this panel. Um, I'm fast becoming a geek, too, on this. <laughs> this has really been very, very interesting, and uh, I had a bunch of questions I want to ask you, but most of them have been talked about. I, I really want to get to the, the nub of what we're talking about here. Um, I'm from California. SMUD is um, my local uh, utility and has been having uh, great customer satisfaction according to J.D. Powers, for at least nine years. 
So we understand, in a sense, SMUD and what SMUD has been trying to do do it with energy efficiencies and renewables and so forth. And sitting here today listening to what you have gone through the Northwest in sharing and, and helping each other, that to me is a um, solution to many of the um, situations that we, we encounter in the western part of the United States. I guess what I'm saying is, is that when we have local solutions and we have policy that actually advocates for uh, energy efficiencies and investments in them, uh, and you have cooperation, it's working. Uh, and I think what I'm looking at from that side <laughs> is the sense that you still need this um, national type of uh, outlook on transmission, which I, I think is important also. But some of it I'm looking at is also that it might be something that we generally look upon as something we do historically in the past as we laid out the freeways and the railroads and things of that nature, which may not work out today. So I guess what I'm going to ask you is that, I guess the four of you or so on this side who have a wish list about what you'd like to see as far as some flexibility moving forward from FERC, and from the other side, what you can accept from this side. Because I think there's a solution here, and I think it's how you go about it is what, it's, what we're talking about today. So kind of quickly, what would you like to see as far as FERC and this, um, this order we're talking about moving forward and implementing it? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do believe, uh, and, and we are supportive of FERC Order 1000 in the sense that it, it does move the ball forward. It helps better focus uh, the planning objectives and the construct for uh, decision making. Uh, what we would like to see is, is that uh, greater flexibility be given so that we can uh, be part of that decision making process in terms of how these projects will be paid for and so that there's clearly uh, measurable benefits. Uh, we have no problem paying for projects for which we benefit, mm -hmm. even if they're located outside of the state that I, that I work in. Uh, but the, the way uh, some of this construct has, has been developed, it perhaps overgeneralizes or assumes a level of social, socialization of the costs uh, and benefits in a way that that creates uh, almost a one-size-fits-all mentality, therefore precluding the ability of, of local solutions, including efficiency, including more strategically placed generation. Uh -huh. Do you all agree also, Mr. Jones and Mr. DeStasio? Yes, yes I, I, I agree with that. I think the Order 1000 struck the balance properly in the execution of it. It's important to continue these regional planning processes that we have in the West between California, the desert Southwest, mm -hmm. and the Northwest. I think those will continue. The proof of the pudding, though, is going to be in the, in the regional planning compliance filings in 12 months. And then, as all of us have mentioned, cost allocation is a key issue. Right. Inter-regional cost allocations. Between California and the Northwest, we have traditionally funded those on participant funding, sure. where the benefits are clearly identified and the beneficiaries pay through a long-term contract. And, and I agree with that. I think to, to put a finer point on it, um, I think Order 1000 um, was a well-intentioned uh, order, but we do need to have beneficiary pays as one of the permissible options for people to share the cost, a willing seller and a willing buyer determining that there's a need for that line. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's not really much I could add other than to, once again, uh, say th this is not really a question I think we all can agree that we need to be looking at a, a robust transmission system that's upgraded, that's going to meet our future needs. But this is really coming down to, once again, you know, where are we going to build this, how much, how much and who's going to pay for it. And that's where the difficulties is occurring right. between. The, can you help us out here? The process <laughs> that Southwest Power Pool has in place takes all of those things into account. The beneficiaries do pay. They're involved in the planning process to ensure that we don't overbuild or underbuild, and the states have total control of the cost allocation methodology. So you think that's a model. Do you agree? 
Uh, yes, that works well for SPP, and actually SPP has been up in the Northwest talking about an energy imbalance market for integrating wind. So we, we like what they're doing. All right, and then I'm over, but maybe I'll allow one more comment here. Thank you. Well, I, I'll just go back to uh, what I said in my prepared comments, uh, and I'm going to quote again one more time from FERC's uh, uh, order. Costs may not be involuntarily allocated to entities that do not receive benefits. End of statement. I mean, that's pretty direct. And uh, I said that I supported this. Uh, and at the end of the day, I would be remiss to say that, you know, I would never support something to be allocated to the customers that I'm entrusted to serve that they didn't get benefits from. Okay. That, thank you very much. And I find this very interesting, uh, Mr. Chairman, because in California, we do have these huge water fights, too, where right. we have to talk about the beneficiary and who pays. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And thank you all very much. We appreciate your time and your uh, expertise. And I would like to say that Mr. Dingle had to leave, but that he did want me to let all of you know that he intends to submit some additional questions to you to answer and get back with us. So we would appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, I just would like asking you just keep the record open for the requisite amount. Of you want me to keep it open for ten days? Yes. Yeah. We'll keep it open for ten days. And uh, we look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. So thank you very much. And that concludes today's Thank hearing. You.